All rise. The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Commissioners, prior to calling our first witness this morning, uh, we'll just provide a brief overview of who we'll be hearing from today. The first witnesses we have are Mr. Michael Fernandez de Viana and Mrs. Patricia Fernandez de Viana, and they're the mother of father of Flying Officer James Fernandez. Uh, we then have Associate Professor Ed Heffernan, who's the Director of Queensland Forensic Mental Health Service. After lunch, we have two lived experience witnesses. One is de-identified as BR1. And shortly after that, we will hear from Ms. Jasmine Carmel, who is the mother of Corporal Jared Brown. And we'll then conclude with um, council assisting closing. I'd also like to record that, uh, just for, for you commissioners, that the state of New South Wales has been given leave to appear generally as of today, and they are appearing here this morning. Thank you. Just before we start, I do want to acknowledge serving and former members of the ADF. Thank you. Commissioners, unless there's anything further, I call Mr. Michael Fernandez de Viana. I confirm that I am holding the Bible for the purpose of administering the oath. Mr. Fernandez de Viana, please respond with I do after the wording of the oath. Mr. Fernandez de Viana, <coughs> do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And I now call Mrs. Patricia Margaret Fernandez de Viana. Mrs. Fernandez de Viana, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr. and Mrs. Fernandez, am I correct in saying that you were giving evidence to, to the Royal Commission this morning because your son, Flying Officer James Fernandez de Viana, died by suicide on 25 July 2019 while serving in the Royal Australian Air Force? Yes. Yep. Yes. And how, and how old was he when he passed away? 26. Twenty-six. And Mrs. Fernandez, on the screen we have a photo that you've provided of your son. I believe it'll be coming up shortly. Can you please tell us where and when that photo was taken? That photo was taken on the 21st of July 2017 at James's Officers Training School graduation in East Sale, RAF Base East Sale. Thank you. And before we proceed any further, uh, I'd just like to say that if, any, if at any stage th this morning you'd like to take a break or you need to stop, just please let me know. We're happy to accommodate you in any way that we can. Thank you. Also, if there are any questions that you don't wish to answer, please just say so. Mr Fernandez, turning to your evidence, in terms of your evidence, am I correct in saying that you have made a statement dated 6 December 2021 in response to a notice to give that was issued to you by the chair of this commission? Yes, that is correct. And Mrs Fernandez? Sorry, pardon me. It's okay. Me. No, no problem. Yes. And you, you've also made a statement. Yours is dated 7 December 2021? Yes. Commissioners, as you're aware, there are two versions of Mr and Mrs Fernandez's statements. There are confidential versions in which personal and confidential information have been redacted. And there are also the unredacted versions of each statement, which will be covered as confidential exhibits by the general non-publication order that has been made by the Royal Commission. Operator, can I please ask that the redacted that the redacted version of Mr. Fernandez's statement, which is document ID MFE.000.0001.0001 underscore R, be displayed on the screen. Mr. Fernandez, can you see that document? You might be on mute. Yes, I can. Thank you. And can the operator please scroll down to the next page? Mr. Fernandez, do you recognise this as the statement you provided to the Royal Commission? 
I do. To the best of your knowledge and belief, is the statement you have provided true and correct? Yes. Commissioners, I tendered the redacted version of Mr Fernandez's statement, being document ID MFE.000.0001.0001 underscore R as a non-confidential public exhibit. Thank you. It will be accepted as an exhibit and allocated the next uh, number. Thank you, Commissioner. The unredacted version will be tendered later as a confidential exhibit. Operator, can I please now ask that the redacted version of Mrs Fernandez's statement, which is document ID PFE.000.0001.0001, be displayed on the screen? And can I please ask that you scroll down to the next page as well? Perhaps just the one after that. Thank you. Mrs Fernandez, do you recognise this as the statement you provided to the Royal Commission? Yes. And to the best of your knowledge and belief, is the statement you provided true and correct? Yes. Thank you. I tendered the redacted version of Mrs Fernandez's statement, being document ID PFE.000.0001.0001 as a non-confidential public exhibit. Thank you. It will be accepted as an exhibit and allocated the next consecutive number. Thank you. And as with Mr Fernandez's statement, the confidential version will be tendered later. Mr and Mrs Fernandez, before discussing your evidence this morning, can I just briefly remind you to please refrain from identifying the names of particular persons in your statement while you give evidence this morning. I make this request for reasons of privacy and confidentiality and note that the commissioners have the unredacted version of your statement and are, are aware of the persons that you have identified therein. Mrs Fernandez, can I please start by asking you to please tell the commissioners a little bit about yourself. Good morning, Commissioners, and thank you for your time. I'm Patricia Margaret Fernandez Daviana. I was born here in Brisbane in 1965 as a New Year's Day baby. I essentially grew up between Brisbane and Gladstone, Queensland. I went to Catholic schooling um, here for most of my schooling here in Brisbane. I did my nursing training at the Marta Hospital just down the road and I graduated as a registered nurse in 1985. At the end of 1986, I met Michael. He was one of my brother's best friends. And from the day I met Michael, I knew that he was gonna be the man that I would marry. We, he moved to Sydney in, in uh, January 1987, and I followed him um, May 1987. We were in Sydney um, to enjoy the uh, bicentennial of the Australian um, landing in Sydney. And by um, January 1988, we moved to Melbourne, where we lived for almost three years. Then I followed Michael to Mackay in Queensland, where our oldest two boys were born. And then, is this okay? Yes, of course. And then in, um, so James was born in Mackay. And uh, I was really, really, really excited to be having a baby. <laughs> and uh, he was obviously so happy to be created that he stayed inside for an extra 10 days. And uh, then in the early hours of the morning, my waters broke. Mm. He tried to come early, actually, at 35 and a half weeks, but they delayed, they stopped the labour. So, yeah, beautiful James arrived on the 4th of... The, sorry, the 7th of February, 1993. And uh, it was just such an exciting moment to hold him in my arms and uh, 
from then on, I didn't get a lot of sleep after he was born because he was a really bright kid. So um, then in 1996, just after we'd had our second child, we moved to the Northern Territory to Nullumboy on the Gulf Peninsula and had almost 11 fantastic years up there in Arnhem Land. And then in at the end of beginning of November, we left Arnhem Land in October 2007, where we moved to Mandurah in Western Australia. And we're still there. And Mr Fanet, can I just ask quickly, how long have you been a nurse for? Um, this is my 40th year. 40th year, thank you. Yeah, including my three years training. Thank you. And Mr Fernandez, can you tell the commissioners just a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, um, I'm first generation Australian. I was born in Sydney um, back in 1963. My parents, uh, mother was a 10 pound pom, um, father, uh, son of a Spanish diplomat. And um, we yeah, grew, grew up in Sydney, up and down the East Coast, traveled a lot. Father was a chemical engineer. Um, yeah, I did chemical, just add to what Patricia said, I did uh, chemical engineering. I graduated the University of Queensland at um, the end of 1984 and, um, you know, work in the sugar industry. Um, milling took me up to Mackay uh, where we started our, got married and started our family, um, you know, from... please yeah sorry yeah, will do thank you um yes yeah, so you know we have our um two, three intelligent boys um who've all been um very uh, strongly aligned with um you know scientific and um interested in engineering that sort of stuff um you know james and i did a, a lot of uh, and Patricia, we you know, and the family, we we love the the camping, um, the outdoor lifestyle, um, biking, um, machinery, all that sort of stuff. So uh, we had many years, you know, in regional Queensland and remote Northern Territory um, before coming across to the um, to Mandurah, where we are um, uh, living living in the beautiful um, beach beach area. And what was uh, flying officer Thank Fernandez you. like as a as a boy and as a young man? Um, he was uh, he was full of life. He was very um, he, he was very interested in um, people. He loved his mates. He loved his family. He included mates and family um, in the same in the same bag. Um, you know, he, he had a when he had his 18th birthday party. He'd have it at home with his friends and family, and um, that was when he was happiest. He loved uh, technology, machinery, all things computers. Um, he, um, you know, mountain bike riding was a, a lifelong passion for him. Up until a few days before he died, he was out riding um, with his mates um, the weekend before. Uh, he loved his music. Um, he was a drummer and he, I think he, you know, he, he was attracted to, you know, the rigour and the discipline um, in, that the Air Defence Force offered um, and he was, you know, very intelligent and, and, ta and talented individual, um, very clever and smart um, and, and, a, and a witty sort of uh, personality. Um, he was always the first one in the room to... You know, get the joke or make the joke, um, and he could hold his own with anyone as a person. Is there anything that you'd like to add to that, Mrs. Fernandez? 
Yeah, I'd also just like to say that James was a really kind, caring person. He had a large amount of empathy and he would always know when someone was in pain and suffering and would go to them to support them. He supported one of his friends from high school who was going through a nasty divorce and after his death, um, that young mother told us that James had helped her through many a night by herself cooking her a meal and helping her look after her newborn baby. She said if it wasn't for James, she just didn't think she would be here. And we didn't know he was living at home and we didn't know that he'd done that and that typifies who and what James was when it comes to caring for other people. And Mrs Fernandez, in your statement, it, it sort of seems that um, Flying Officer Fernandez always had a strong interest in joining the Australian, Air, Australian Defence Forces. Can you tell the commissioners a little bit about how your son came to join the Air Force? Do you mean the recruitment process or leading up well, to that, his childhood? Or both. Why did, why did okay. he join? Why did he join the Air Force? Well, he was <clears throat> always obsessed with what he called Army-Navy and he was, said he was going to be Army-Navy pilot. That's quote unquote Army-Navy pilot. He would make weapons out of anything. He made his own spud gun when he was 11. When he was uh, 10, he blew up matchbox cars. I don't know how, but I was horrified when I found out he did. And he always loved a uniform. So then um, when he was in high school, year 11, he went through the process of applying to the Navy to be a weapons electrical engineer and, um, or officer, a WEO as it was called. And uh, he at that point in time was not successful in his recruitment to the Navy. He, whilst he was um, studying his engineering, electron, electrical engineering at Curtin, at some stage he revisited joining the Defence Force and uh, that wasn't an easy process. The recruitment process, I was shocked and horrified at how many times I had to provide the same documents for him over and over again because the documentation had been lost by the recruitment officers and that was stressful for James, you know. He was just really keen originally to join the Navy. That was what he wanted to do. So eventually after, I think it was like three, almost four year process, they even at one stage completely lost his application and we had to start that process again. And then when James had his U session, every career on the U session was ticked. So he showed me and I said to him, oh James, you can do anything. You could even be a pilot. And I went, but look, you could be a musician. I said, why don't you go in as a musician? You know, that'd be fun. You can play guitar and drums, you know. He went, don't be ridiculous. And then chance conversation with a person who was in the Navy. Um, I told her that James had had his youth session and every career had been ticked. And I said, oh, even pilot. And she said, well, he must apply to be a pilot because... Not everyone gets that opportunity and it would be a regret not to go through with that. So that's when he then did a lot of research about being a pilot in one of the forces and chose ultimately to join the Air Force as a pilot cadet. And about, <clears throat> about when was that? I'm, I can't recall, but I... I think that would have been 2015, 2016. And just before he joined the Air Force, he also completed a Bachelor of Engineering, didn't he? Correct. Yeah. Graduating with first class honours? Correct. A month before <coughs> he flew out to the Air Force. Mr Fernandez, can I ask you, um, he then flies out to the Air Force and undertakes, he goes to basic flying training school. Uh, what was your understanding of his experience at that school? Yeah, look, um, from the conversations we had, I think, you know, his experience was um, 
Very excited. Um, first time he'd ever been away from home for his family in his life, um, apart from a few little stints for a few days as a student uh, in Perth. The way I saw it, um, he was, you know, living on, on, if you like, on training base and, and really loved the, the camaraderie, the socialised, the, you know, the career and, and the excitement, um, quite awe-inspiring. Um, I, I guess, you know, a period of months, um, if things started progressing rather slowly, trying to get flights and that sort of stuff, um, they eventually came and... And, and then as, as the training progressed, uh, I think, it, you know, difficulties sh showed up in, you know, in, in the extreme difficulty of, of the testing and um, as it gets more advanced, you know, the ability to do multiple tasks at, this, at the same time. Um, it, and this is not my field at all, but as I understand it, you know, I might be um, getting towards instruments and, and nights and special landing stuff. Um, that got harder and harder and he... Um, Eventually felt like he was getting behind and not doing too well, um, which was really stressful for him. Uh, certainly, um, you know, so there was some failure of some, you know, some flying tests, um, although he did, you know, certainly um, pass the, the initial um, solo flying. Um, as he got past that, um, it became harder and harder and, and really uh, stressful for him and failed and he got to the point where... Um, he was just about at the end of the line and had one more chance and he, you know, he decided um, not, not, not to do his oral appeal for that. Um, he basically, I think, given up, um, lost hope um, and, um, you know, d just didn't have the, the confidence or the strength to then, then go through with that. Um, and, you know, one stage he said to me, um, you know, I... It, it just feels like I'm I'm, I'm flying a bus with wings. Um, it's it's lost its passion and excitement. Um, so, you know, then from that point, he was he was basically, I think, you know, felt like he was, if you like, out of a job, and at a loose end. Can I please add to that? Of course, yes. I also remember James <coughs> saying that he had difficulty getting the time flying a plane. So whether it was because he was um, ranked lower as one of the pilot officer cadets or what, I don't know. I've got no evidence, but I do remember him saying that he wasn't getting the practical time in a plane that others were getting. No, thank you. Yeah, I concur with that. And it was about in December 2018, I think, that he, he leaves basic flying trains, training school September. September, thank you. And he returns to Western Australia for a period of three months, doesn't he? He definitely returns to Western Australia. I'm not sure on the on how long he was there for. Well, Mr Fernandez, can I ask you, what what is your recollection of then what happened after he left basic flying training school? Yeah, so, so, so what, what happened then was um, there was a period where James basically in limbo, if you like, at a loose end. So um, he, he came home and sort of essentially was on annual leave um, and was just said, wait, wait at home. Uh, he wanted to he, he wanted to do nothing more than take a break at this really awful time for him um, to, you know, do things like go snowboarding in Japan or, um, go skiing down south, uh, you know, um, that that wasn't allowed. Um, he had to use his holidays up and basically stay at home, uh, wasn't allowed to, to go anywhere. Um, you know, for a person who hadn't been there long, five weeks of hard-earned holidays, um, was just really frustrating and upsetting and, you know, it's the thing he really did need for his mental health um, at that point. And um, from that point he was... I'll be jumping ahead a little bit here, but, you know, he really wanted to get home, be with his family, be in Western Australia and, you know, get back into his passion of, you know, something like a naval um, a naval weapons engineer on a, on a ship, you know, and uh, that's where he was, where he was headed. But um, there was no way that they, uh, RAF could seem to d facilitate that sort of transition out of the Air Force and across... Um, and that, that was really 
dragging James down and, you know, he felt like he was um, just, it's hard to say, but I, I guess um, lost, sad, um, depressed about it. Um, you know, and, and during that time, in retrospect, he, he was joining the dots. He was very depressed. He was, he was basically lying in his room in his bed for weeks on end. Um, you know, very low. He'd become very lonely, I think, as well. Um, very keen to see uh, friends and that sort of stuff. So did he yeah. want to transition to the Navy but found it too difficult? Yeah, he uh, felt like he came up from a bureaucratic administrative brick wall. Um, it just wasn't happening. And the only way he could do that was totally throw everything on the line and, and resign altogether. And being um, sort of loyal, de- dedicated and sensitive sort of person, he just didn't want to do that. Um, you know, he just didn't want to cut it all off and throw himself into the wind. Um, so so that's, that's where he was stuck. Can I just add to that? So <clears throat> he was sent home initially, he was told, for two weeks to lick his wounds, is what he told me, and that that was a fairly normal process. And then other people would, from there, he would be going on to another posting. And that didn't happen. And as Michael said, he was told to he would have to discharge from the Air Force and reapply to the Navy, that there was no chance of a transfer. And with the poor experience he'd had with recruiting in the first place, there was no way he was going to do that. So he stayed with the Air Force but his heart was really with the Navy and he's always loved the sea. Can I ask? And if I, if I may add something? Yeah, look, and this went on for weeks and weeks. I think he virtually ran down all of his annual leave um, before any sort of support leave or... Um, some other contingency was available and then I think, you know, it, just a feeling without having the numbers, of course, you know, felt like once his annual leave was was used up, things then sort of started to move, you know. Um, it was felt like around a month um, at least um, just uh, licking his wounds. And Thank you. What was your understanding then, or Mrs Fernandez, of exactly what was happening during that period? Was he meant to be taking some time off or choosing his next role or reflecting on what he wanted to do? Or what, what was he doing? So initially it was two weeks to regroup, regather after the failure of the basic flight training school. ended up in, he didn't um, really want to be there, wasn't really what his expertise lay in. And I was also told by the CO of that unit that (laughs) after James had died, that they have extreme difficulty recruiting people into that unit and specifically the position that James was recruited into. And this was one of the things that he experienced with recruitment in the beginning is that he was being shunted into the position originally that the recruiters have targets to fill. So just to step through that, can I just 
So after the period of time that he spends in Western Australia, he then goes and is posted to an administrative role in Sale in Victoria. Correct. And from there, he then goes to the Edinburgh base in South Australia. Correct. Yes. Can I also ask, um, what is your understanding, Mr Fernandez, you mentioned that he wasn't allowed to travel anywhere while he was in Western Australia. What's your understanding of of that and why he wasn't allowed to travel anywhere? Uh, is that is that in Australia yeah, or yeah. overseas as well or is that? Uh, definitely um, overseas and I, I had the feeling um, basically anywhere, you know, um, you know, qualitatively more than a couple of hours because um, he could get called up and sent anywhere at any moment, you know, on an assignment. So pack your bags and go sort of thing. Um, that, that was my understanding. Um, he was sort of in limbo as a as ready to go. So, um, and that was a real, real source of um, frustration. Now, can I just ask you both just about Flying Officer Fernandez's death by suicide? Mrs Fernandez, what is your understanding of the events and circumstances leading to him taking his own life? Uh, I believe it was compounded psychological issues, depression that we hadn't recognised that go right back to his failure at the basic flight training school. I believe that that the antibiotics he was put on as an anti-malarial drug trial, doxycycline, was um, was something that he should never have been put on because it's a very strong antibiotic. In my professional career, it's only ever been used as a second or third line antibiotic in conjunction with other antibiotics to treat resistant chest infections. Uh, that antibiotic would have killed his microbiome, which is your gut flora. You need two kilograms to help you digest your food. And also that's essential in helping make serotonin, which is the feel-good hormone. So he's had that effect, that's been affected by the initial antibiotic. He then had stress of the moving with the different positions, the having to find himself a position within the Defence Force when his reserves were low because of probably feeling a failure at the failure of the BFTS. Um, he was doing a job he didn't particularly like and I imagine that that was in a darkened bunker in the middle of a building in the middle of winter in Adelaide. So I'm not certain as to what his vitamin D levels would have been. I believe the food on the bases was never good. He was always complaining about being hungry from um, BFTS onwards. He said that the portions of food were very heavily controlled by the contractors that the vegetables and all that were um, not very tasty and so he resorted to attempting to cook his own meals to have decent nutrition. Um, I believe he was over-prescribed medications that a 26-year-old male should never ever have been prescribed and that if a health professional had looked at all the medication he was on, the signs of stress would have been there quite clearly, well they are there quite clearly with the medications that he was prescribed. Um, and I know this because he entered as a 24 year old who had been through the rigorous screening process to be a pilot and two and a half years later he reaches the point that he's so unwell physically and mentally that he chooses to end his life. Um, I think that he was lonely on base and just really wanted to come back to his family. Uh, I believe he was in a relationship with a person that he met whilst at 
East Sale that he gave emotional support to and then he rescued her from a violent relationship. Her partner was jailed in Melbourne for domestic violence. Um, I believe that James had an indiscretion with a, another person whilst the girlfriend was overseas on a three-month holiday. It wasn't like James to be um, an, in having infidelity, but I think the loneliness and depression caused him to make a bad decision and get involved with another person. Uh, that other woman's partner was also in the same unit as James and he let James's girlfriend know overseas via messenger that James was having an affair. I believe there was um, bullying and hazing as a result of that, but we, ha we cannot get the evidence of that. Um, I believe that James should have been able to access independent medical treatment for all of the medication he was on because he was constantly ringing me, asking me for health advice and how he could be cooking meals. And I think it was a compound of just not feeling as though he was able to meet the morals, his moral standards and... Uh, and just had no emotional or physical reserves. And whilst you don't have good nutrition to support you physically, because he was always starving, coupled with the drugs he was on that would have affected his microbiome, I think that all these things conspired together to cause a perfect storm. No, thank you. Thank you, Mrs Fernandez. Um, Mr Fernandez, can, can I ask you, and I'll return to some of the issues that you have raised just a little bit later, but um, what, what do you think were the main factors that you believe may have contributed to your son's death? Yeah, yeah look, I, I certainly agree with all the um, information and comments provided by Patricia. Probably just a bit to add to that, um, you know, the, the pilot training school um, seems like a you know a sausage machine that has a really high level of design rejection. So, um, although all of the I think it like the basic training, um, they're very proud that everybody passed in, in in first time in a long time. But then the next level when you're actually flying, um, you know the attrition rate is it just seems huge. It just seems like candidates falling like flies, and, and you know. By the time graduation day comes, only small. And then I think added to that, the you know, the, for the the byproduct or the, the dropouts sort of thing, like James was, not resolved, didn't seem to be any sort of transitional career um, counselling, you know, real world practical level. They've all done the, you know, the courses on mental health and that. Um, you know, the practical reality of, of, of that care and that transition. Sorry, I think we've I think we've lost you just for a moment. Are you on mute? Yep. Sorry, it's come under mute. Um, yeah. So the care, uh, the care and the transition to manage the the, the failure. Um, he felt like he was he was you know on his own. Um, the you know in addition to that um, you know in the in the final days when. You know, James was having a lot of, uh, if you like, those relationship issues, you know, um, went to the doctor the day before and I'm not sure that why nothing was picked up with the, the medical doctor, you know, calling in absent to work the day before or turning up for a little bit. Um, that's all, don't have a lot of details, but I know he told, told his boss sort of thing, okay, um, I, I need to stay home. I'm, I'm really tired. Um, you know, so missing in respect those late late cues um, that that add up by a number of people, um, and the fact that you know the night before, you know he, James is strongly strongly driven by his, his social interaction. That the Air Force was his new family. You know that's why I felt so comfortable and 
um, not expecting this anyway. That because you know, as I say, the Air Force is his family. Um, but you know, that family in, in the in the few days before, um, normally on a Wednesday night, they all go out. I was told, and you know, have a you know chicken wings and that sort of stuff. Uh, no one knocked on his door last night. He was in that last night. He was on his own in that room. He was, you know, he was isolated, very lonely, potentially, you know, ruminating, catastrophizing, I believe, um, thinking himself a failure. I know that because it was in his suicide note. Um, and he, the other factors, you know, leading up to that in, in a longer term, I, I think, you know, he found the financial side challenging, you know, the low pay for the type of role that he was doing, you know, the fact that um, there was a significant charge for food of poor quality, you know, the accommodation charge, the fact that it was very hard for him to, you know, get ahead uh, financially as well, you know, the, the financial stress was just another factor um, that was culminating in, into that um, perfect storm. Thank you. Thanks. Can I just pick up on something that you were just saying there, because it's something that emerges strongly in your statement, and it's what you say is the lack of support that was provided to your son. And in your statement, you draw a distinction between immediate support being the type of support that you get immediately and ongoing when you're at flying training school and then after failing flying training school, but you also refer to more long-term support and career support and career guidance. Can you please tell the commissioners what you think could or should have been done differently in terms of support and care in your son's case? Yeah, um, I, I guess there's a couple aspects of that. You know, clearly, um, I would believe that um, for you know for, for such a big um, falling off the cliff career-wise for a young person in their first first um, exciting attempt in life, that you know there should be that. The you know the counselling, the career guidance, the, you know the caring, felt leadership, um, and facilitation you know, to you know to get in the navy and the defence force, uh, for example, in, in James's case, you know um, these are administrative barriers that you know are there. I can't see they they're not there. It doesn't seem to have the individual at heart. It has, it has the system, the process um, driving it. Um, you know, in the in the shorter term, um, certainly, you know, counselling and care um, when when James was, you know, clear, clearly suffering, um, living on base, you know, living with all these people. Um, yeah, look, I know the chaplains there and that sort of stuff, but um, you know, the the check in and the care. Um, you know, we realised that um, you know James. Well, Patricia had told me James had broken up with his girlfriend uh, when I got home on the Wednesday, uh, the day before um, he died, a um, matter of hours. So I tried to tried to call James. Um, his phone was off. Um, as it turns out, you know, he was in his room isolated and his computer was all off and he was making, potentially making preparations. Um, but I had no, I had no way of um, contacting James. Um, no, if you like, welfare check procedure, no contacts at the base. Um, nothing, you know, I, I think, you know, I know if James was home, um, he'd still be alive today when that happened. Um, but he was at the base in an isolated way, no one to turn to, um, feeling like a total abject failure um, and no one there to knock on his door on that Wednesday night before and, you know, check in on him or uh, no process for... Um, uh, acting on behalf of the family to uh, a rigorous process for saying uh, getting getting a welfare check on him, which I wanted to do. Um, you know, no contact number, no, so no preparation with the need some sort of preparation with with the family as they are the caretaker family uh, for a young man um, away from home. Because you tried to call him on the night that he died by suicide, didn't you? So, and that's what you're talking about there. You just had no no way of getting in contact yeah. with him. Yeah, so the, the night before, you know, the sign I, I heard the day, you know, the, the trigger point for me as a, as a father 
was the fact that he'd broken up with a relationship um, with a girlfriend. It was granted, you know, six months maximum type of relationship, but that is, you know, one of the most traumatic things in the life of a, a young person's triggered certainly by, you know, on his own and all these other issues. Um, I, there was no, no, I had no way of contacting him, you know, reaching out. Um, and so all I could do was wait for the morning and, and try again. And unfortunately, you know, at, at sort of, you know, around 4 a.m., 3 to 4 a.m., um, Wednesday night into Thursday morning, he, you know, he, he'd ta taken the, the decision to, to end his life. Um, so we didn't, that, op that brief window of opportunity was lost in the moment. Um, yeah. Mrs. Finn. Yeah, no, I was just about to ask, you, you also tried to call your son on the, the night that he died. Can, yeah. can I ask what changes would you like to see made? So first of all, I'd like to um, see that there be psychological support right back when he failed at BFTS because I'm not aware of there being any psychological support available. I think it should be a matter of course that any of these young men or women who drop out any stage in the pilot training program need to have intensive counselling. I've come across a friend of James from um, his officer's training school that also did BFTS with James and then was in his second pilot training course here at Pierce Air Force Base and I met him a week before he was due to graduate from the second training school and he had been booted off the program and he was one of those kids that always wanted just to be a pilot and he was suicidal at the point in time I met him. So a week before he was due to finish the second course, he was booted off. I also met another friend of James who got to the day before he was due to graduate from the second course at Pierce as a jet fighter pilot and he was booted off the course and sent over east to be flying the big aircraft. No counselling provided to these two young men. Um, I think that there needs to be regular mental health checks. I think that there needs to be um, a culture in which people talk about mental health issues as much as we would talk about diabetes or having a broken bone. I would like the whole culture to destigmatise mental health, that it is just another part of the body. I'm not saying that your brain is not significant, but I think it's time as a society, and particularly with the Defence Force, that we stop seeing people with a mental illness as being broken. It is just at that point in time, something within them is not working as it should be, just as I might have a muscle strain or a muscle sprain. Um, sorry, what was your – back to your no, question? My, thanks. No, my, my question was, uh, do you have any views on how the Defence Force might connect any available family support with the serving member and their unit? I think that we should be, as a family, given crucial numbers and I have heard that someone, someone recently told me that they did, as a parent, they did have the number of their son's um, – unit commander or someone within the unit when she was concerned about his mental health in Darwin, she was able to ring um, a commanding officer and say, I'm concerned about my son and he was checked on and sure enough, he was suicidal. So I think family members should have an emergency contact num number, either of someone within the unit or someone on the base if they're living on base. In the instance like James, he turned off his phone and I tried to ring him at 5.30 that night, the night before on Wednesday the 24th of July because I'd been speaking with him in the morning. I knew that he wasn't in a good position mentally. I knew that he'd broken up with his girlfriend and uh, I asked him to promise me that he would ring, him, ring me when he got home from work. And at 5.30 West Australian time I realised I hadn't heard from him and that he should have finished work. And when I phoned through... I'm pretty sure that I got his voicemail 
And an hour later when Michael came home, the first thing I said to him is, have you heard from James? He's broken up with his girlfriend. And he said, no, I'll ring him now. So Michael phoned James and his phone was turned off. I could have got to Adelaide by 10 o'clock that night. That's what the time the flight would have arrived. If I had known, looking back now, that he was in a serious position as he was, I could have got there to him and saved his life. <laughs> or at least had to call someone that we could call to say, go check on him, please. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Thank you, Mrs. Fernandez. Um, Mr. Fernandez, can I just ask you, just returning to something that you mentioned earlier, just about the Navy and his desire to transition after departing basic flying school? Um, you said that was all very difficult. It was too hard. Is that something that you think needs to change? Yeah. Look, I think you know when you see what what the outcome of that current situation was, you know, a total loss, a total tragedy. Um, it, you know, it, 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 there needs to be a much more uh, insightful and a caring um, and a considerate process, um, you know, based on the needs and wants of the individual for job satisfaction, mental health and, and putting people into the right, right job that fits them because he wanted to be home near his family um, and you know, it was just a total wall, you know, like a, an administrative wall and it wasn't happening. So, you know, it, it certainly needs, you know, and this would be a huge benefit for the country to, you know, to, to really connect people up with um, careers right through each each wing of the Defence Force, if you like, um, Army, Navy, Air Force, location, um, wants... And, and needs for, you know, their, if you like, personal job satisfaction, passion, skills um, and, and, you know, desires um, rather than feeling, I guess, just like a, a cog in the machine, um, powerless and um, unable to influence or anyone, unable to reach out to anyone who could influence to help them achieve those goals. So that they need to have, I believe, um, those sort of contacts and processes in place to achieve that. Thank you. Mrs Fernandez, you raise a, a number of matters in your statement. I might just touch on some of them, because some of them we've already discussed, but um, can I please ask the operator to bring up document ID PFE.000 dot triple zero one dot triple zero one at page number dot zero zero two zero His motivations for joining the Defence Force was because he wanted to travel the world. Thank you. No, no, thank you. Um, what I have on the screen now are just a, a list of the medications that you say that you were provided with, um, along with the personal effects from your son's room at his um, base in Edinburgh. Um, can I just ask you, just sort of quickly, what, as a nurse, were you surprised by this? I was horrified, absolutely horrified when I unpacked his personal effects and found all of this with the, amongst the things that were um, from his bathroom. But I had seen them on base and um, in his room when I went to his room after he died. I'd seen them and I was 
actually actively looking for them when they came back home, hoping that they hadn't been removed from his personal effects. Do you, do you know why this medication was provided to your son? <laughs> the doxycycline, which is B, was because he had a skin rash from shaving every day because he's got delicate skin like mine. He had, sorry, delicate skin like mine. And it's archaic rule of the Air Force, he had to be clean shaven. So because he shaved every day, he ended up with the skin rashes. So he was given, I don't know why A was prescribed, the amoxicillin, the doxycycline and B was prescribed for his face. C was prescribed for his face, metronidazole, which is a really another strong antibiotic that we use in conjunction with others. The Novazone is a steroid cream. I can only assume that was for his face. The Nexium is for heartburn, indication that he's extremely stressed. He never had heartburn or heart trouble, um, reflux issues before. Zavirax is because of cold sores. Antibacterial lozenges is because he had sore throats. Nasal de decongestion is because he had a blocked nose. Codril cold tablets must have had a heavy head cold at some stage. Mylanta is an antacid. Um, I can't, that was in tablet form. Betadine's an antibiotic for him to put on his skin, which is going to contribute to the issue because betadine is going to kill all of the skin flora. It's a used in surgical preparation. We don't use it in, um, my, in my practice. I have adv advanced wound care management qualifications and we never use betadine on the skin unless it's a pre-operative um, cleaning because um, it just interrupts the normal flora. And a decongestant nasal spray, so a second decongestant nasal spray, and buy on tears for dry eyes. He's 26. Why is he getting dry eyes? Well, can I just ask you then, what, what do you think should have occurred differently by way of his medical treatment? What would you like to have seen? If it was me difference? and I came across a 26-year-old with all this medication, I'd have joined the dots and gone, this is an indication of extreme stress. I also would have been asking more questions as to why are you needing all these things. This is not a medication that a normal young healthy person should have been prescribed. I really would like that there be review of these sorts of prescribing. I have seen his medical record as a result of the IGADF um, and I was horrified at how cumbersome that document was and how difficult it actually was to scroll through and easily access this kind of information. It was fragmented and as a health professional with the time constraints, I would find it very difficult to find the time to go back and review all of the history of James. And this, towards the end from memory, he was seeing doctors like or medicos frequently, like weekly. And that in itself is why has a healthy 24-year-old entered the RAF who ends up seeing a doctor or someone, a health professional, weekly. Um, I'd like the program to be, the medical um, database program to be improved. There are many good programs out there that allow you to quickly and easily stroll between screens to check for medication, history, allergies, um, recent visits. I think that there should be regular health reviews by health professionals, particularly young people who have been put into high stress areas or anyone because the change of entering in the Defence Force is a huge life change. So I think there should be a thorough review after initial training and then six monthly after and if they're healthy, showing signs of being healthy and not requiring frequent medication, then it could go to yearly in accordance with best practice, with um, general practice of people. Everyone's entitled to a yearly health review. I'd like to see the policy of necessitating young people to shave daily or anyone to shave daily be removed. I understand that might be necessary for um, fighter pilots. 
I'm horrified that our middle son went in the army had to dry shave in the field. Your skin is your first line of defence to infection and here we are expecting men to use a razor on their face without any water or cream. That just to me is beyond belief. Um, I would like the quality and quantity of food to be thoroughly reviewed on bases to assist with ensuring that our Defence Force members are given good nutrition so that they can conduct their um, jobs without food insecurity. And James had food insecurity. Can I, can I just ask a question about the medical records that you mentioned? So in your statement, you say that you've requested the medical records but haven't ob obtained them but that you're able to see them for a few hours at some stage? Yeah, so... How did, that, how did that come about? So the barrister representing James for the investigator General. General ADF into his death, I asked him to get access to James's medical records because I'd put in an application under FOI not long after James died because I knew that the medication was an issue and... I was not allowed to do that. Michael had to do it as the next of kin and we have not yet received that medical record under FOI. We also applied for his record of service under FOI and so the barrister managed to access that document for us which we were allowed to look at for a couple of hours or as long as we needed but obviously time was limited because he's a busy man. So... I, Can I um, just pause one moment, Mike, uh, Mr. Fernandez? Are you are you with us still? Yes, I am. Thanks, sorry, I just wanted to check. Thank you. Sorry, please continue. Yeah. Um, sorry, what was I saying? You were talking about how you obtained oh, yeah, access so, to the records. Yeah, so the the knowledge that I have is from the two hours of looking at his medical record. And obviously the medication list is because I have them in my possession. And what is, hap what is happening with your request for medical records? Do you know? Nothing. nothing. Michael, do you know? No, I've heard nothing. I'm not aware that we're about to receive anything that we've requested. And what's your understanding then of the Inspector General of the Australian Defence Force report, reporting process? So you're able to see the medical records throughout that process. Have you received the IGADF report? No. And we weren't able to see the medical record throughout the whole process. It was the last visit we had with the barrister and we got to see it for a couple of hours. We've been given no... We were given a draft report which the barrister helped us to defend James's honour because that was... Um, scathing and condemning in one aspect in relation to the oh, I, I relationship. Won't, I won't get you to mention it, yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and it, we've heard nothing more from the IGADF. I don't know if we ever will receive a final report. So you haven't been... There was no time indication about when you might receive it or the next no, steps? Or? No, but we were put under time pressure to finalise our side of the story... It was a matter of urgency, so we did that in the timeline of the idea ADF, not our timeline. So we were put under pressure to get it done quickly because they wanted to finalise the matter. Right. Uh, the only other issue that I'd like to um, have a ask you a quick question about is just one that you raised that the two issues um, after the death of your son and it concerns the repatriation of his body back to Western Australia and also the cleaning of his room both you refer to as being extremely distressing can you please tell the commissioners a little bit about that so on the day I found out James had died and uh, with the people from the ADF that came the first thing I said to them was, could you please leave James's room as it was? Because I knew that seeing that room would be an indication for me of how he was when he left that room at 3.30 in the morning. Half an hour later, he was dead. 
I only wanted to go into that room to see how he'd left it. That would have been a big clue to his mental state. But I also wanted to be able to be where he'd last been alive that I could be and just to smell his smell in the room. By the time I arrived in Adelaide about 10 days later, his room had been completely sanitised. Everything in his room had been itemised. Because they knew I wanted to come in, they'd staged the unmaking of his bed. I really felt as though I felt quite violated. I felt that his space had been violated. I didn't get to have that last clue as to how he was feeling. And the other thing is that we had to pay for the repatriation of his body back to Western Australia from Adelaide because the amount of money available for his funeral was not going to cover it. And because we were in Western Australia, it was going to be up to $10,000 to be flying his body over. And at the time, we've got a really good friend who's in the funeral, is a funeral director in South Australia who knew James. His wife was his teacher in year four and five in Nullamboy. <laughs> he arranged for James's body to be transported by road. <laughs> and by the time he arrived back to us, his body was in no fit state for a viewing. <laughs> and there were family members and friends of his that really wanted to be able to say goodbye to him. And that was not allowed because of the time frame that it took for him to be travelling across the Nullarbor. And I just think that to have given him an airfare in death would have been the least that could have been done. If he was alive, he would have been given an airfare to come back to Western Australia. So how disrespectful when he's dead not to pay for him to come home. Thank you, Mrs. Fernandez. Um, Mr. Fernandez, is there anything else that you would like to say this morning to the commissioners? Any issues or any other recommendations? Um, like yeah, look, um, I, I guess what was also on my mind, James's, you know, James's role in his last final job involved, you know, very high level of top secrecy, and, and he couldn't talk to us about anything about his job and. Yeah, you know, I felt that, you know, spilled over into potentially how he could talk to us and how he could talk to us about his, you know, his his mental health. So it needs to be more more counselling and and support there, and um, you know, also other people perhaps um, being senior welfare officers to. Um, to check in on James when, when he's, you know, especially when he's staying on base in that intense environment. Also, you know, felt, as Patricia said, uh, that a, a revolving door of medical practitioners um, gets nowhere when it comes to a complex case of uh, putting the timeline together and consequently no surprise. So, you know, um, most of us all in the civilian all have our, our own doctor who knows us and cares for us and, and puts it all together. Um, that was, you know, to totally um, absent, I believe. believe um, you know, the food is driven by saving money um, and minimising contractor costs. Um, I, I think there's, there definitely needs to be more to support the social life and the camaraderie, I believe. You know, the officer's mess used to be a holy grail of social life. And I believe the Air Force uh, will, re, you know, resolve that um, problem of, of drinking by, you know, increasing the price of alcohol out of sight um, potentially. But, you know, wh what have we got to replace it to actually um, needs to be more stuff to provide camaraderie and um, family life? James took advantage of everything that was there. He, uh, he was going on a ski trip. Um, he was joining some other activities um, and it, 
re- and you know despite the fact that he was so excited about um, going to the US um, how, how could all those things of a bright future and a bright career who someone who was you know to IC and slated to be in charge of the Air Force um, not have um, support um, and coaching and mentoring at that that deep level to care about their mental health as well. Um, needs to be a better process to to check in. Um, you know, when somebody rings in sick um, in a strange way, um, yeah, actually follow that up. Um, and you know, and and the, the level of medical care that the day before, um, hours before committed suicide, a doctor hasn't picked up on anything uh, in relation to um, state of mental health and wellbeing um, needs to be consideration um, given to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr Fernandez. And Can I just clarify that point? We were given information that James had a doctor's appointment Wednesday afternoon the day before he died, but we've not been able to confirm from the medical records that I saw whether he actually saw a doctor or not, whether he attended the appointment, but he definitely had an appointment for the Wednesday afternoon before he died. Thank you. Thanks. Commissioners, I don't have any further questions. Do you have any questions for Mr and Mrs Fernandez? Yes, thank you. Commissioner Brown. I just uh, wanted to clarify um, the time frame, the FOI request, when you put that in. Do you recall? That would have been... Um, I can get that date because... Oh, the, the date, the precise date doesn't matter so much. It's just I'm just trying to understand the, the uh, length of the time. You've so it would have been around... November 2019. Okay, so two years. Yes. Yes, because it was after Remembrance Day 2019, I was given the information by a vet of how to access that. And the IGADF, you, you indicated you'd been pressured to get your response in. How long ago was that? How long have you been waiting for the conclusion of that process? Two years. Okay, thank you. And my, my other question was just a, a broader one about engagement of the family through the process of James' um, career with the ADF. Was there any engagement with the family? No, other than his graduation from officers' training school, but only with his classmates, no, no superiors or anything, no. Thank you. Commissioner Douglas, I just have a few questions. Um, just in relation to the investigation by the Inspector General, were you interviewed by them or was it simply a submission that you put in through legal representation? We were interviewed by them. Okay, and your legal representation, did you fund that yourself? No, that was provided by the Defence Force. Did it was a barrister who is Navy Reserve. So you didn't select him? No. Okay. Um, and as I understand it, to this day, you have not had any notification that the investigation by the Inspector General has been completed? No, we have not. No outcome? No. Okay. Just in relation to the coroner's process, um, your son died within South Australia. Were you, did you have any contact with the coroner or the coroner's office in South Australia? Yes, um, Michael, as the next of kin, had that. Okay. Perhaps Mr Fernandez can just explain. I just um, would like to know uh, what contact you had with them, if there was an interview process with the coroner's court? No, there was, there was no interview process. Um, it was very minimal. It was just around the basic details of when his body was available and, um, you know, what condition it would be in. And it seemed to be you know, time was ticking. Um, my wife went over there and, um, you know, we, we felt as though it would be, it felt like, um, you know, around 10 days or so that it was there. That's just um, a, a feeling. And, um, you know, it was very uh, frustrating of when it would be out, but no, there was no interview. Um, 
nothing of substance really. Okay. Were you informed at any stage of any protocols that you could have utilised to request an inquest? No. no. Was any grief counselling no. offered by the coroner's court? No. The grief counselling that you mentioned in your statement and ultimately you funded it yourself, um, was that initially funded by the ADF? Yeah, that was funded through Open Arms. I phoned them one day when I was absolutely desperate and got a fantastic woman on the phone and um, she counselled me for, I think, about half an hour and said that she would arrange for us to go to counselling as a family. So we went. Our youngest son was not interested in counselling at that point in time. And so Michael and I and our middle son went to a counsellor in Rockingham who is used by the Navy because she's a PTSD expert. Yes, we'll do. And that he hadn't even uttered a word and she's looking at his body language and this is a month or two, like two months, within two months of his brother having died. So I don't blame him sitting there with his arms crossed. So on his body language, she's decided he's a very un angry young man and telling him you need to deal with your anger otherwise you're going to have a really unhappy life and you have issues with women it just was bizarre and out of the blue and because you're vulnerable and grieving and in a numb stage out of politeness we stayed there for the full hour I had to go to work after that I just like felt sick Mark and I also went to um, a grief organization for the parents bereaved by suicide in Mandurah which just traumatized us even more that so we stopped going there and then we got, I got back in touch with Open Arms to say that this counsellor was not working for any of us and Michael got referred to a counsellor who you found helpful, Michael, yeah? Yes. Order. Yes, I agree. And then I ended up in the Perth Clinic of January this year with an overdose and alcoholism as a result of James's death <laughs> and was referred to a 10-week CBT course and the counsellor I had in that I now see privately and I pay partly Medicare funded and the rest we pay ourselves. Thank you. I'm sorry you had to get through that, but um, we do appreciate you telling us about your experience, obviously. I have one more issue that I just want Can to Can I raise. just add, please, Commissioner, that I yes. think if we had better counselling back in the first six months, I don't think I'd have got to the stage where I lost the battle with alcohol. Yeah, I understand, and the reason I asked about the counselling in particular is I certainly share your view. It is essential and essential to have it in a timely manner after someone's passed on. And someone who is a specialist in dealing with the grief by suicide. Yes. 
Um, I just have one other issue, um, just in relation to your access to the medical records. You mentioned that you had access for a couple of hours, you could see them for a couple of hours. Perhaps Mr Fernandez or yourself, I don't know who it was that accessed the records. If you can just explain to us how that came about and what happened. Why is it only, you, you weren't allowed to take anything away, I gather, you could only view it somewhere for a couple of hours? So the, the barrister that was assisting us with the IGADF investigation provided a copy on... Can you remember, Michael? It was... It was just a paper copy. Um, yeah, of pages that we could sit and review um, when he came to our house and uh, sat around the table and looked through them. We had a, you know, a limited time of an hour or so. We couldn't have copies or anything. It was just like a viewing, I called it. Thank you. Uh, Mr Shepto, is there anything arising? No, no, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to take this um, opportunity to remind everyone who's with us, either here or, or, vi or virtually, that we do have support staff available, certainly for the people who are here. Um, we have counsellors available. They can make themselves known to you if you just talk to any of the staff members. If anyone does feel trauma from listening uh, today, please do make use of, of their time and talk to them about um, what you may be feeling today. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Fernandez, I just want to thank you for your, your, your candour, your being with us today, and for you being willing to share your experience with us. We need the insights and, and we really appreciate it. And I'm sorry for what you've been through. Thank you, I really appreciate the uh, enormous task that you have, Commissioners, but I thank you from the bottom of our heart on behalf of our son, James. But I'd also like to acknowledge the fantastic um, the fantastic work done by the Commission team in helping us get to this stage. I just would like to public acknowledge them all. They've been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Shepto, is something arising? Uh, just to say thank you so much for both having the courage to come forth today and give evidence, so thank you. Okay. Uh, commissioners, that is the evidence of Mr and Mrs Fernandez. May they please be released from their summonses? Yes, um, you're released from the summons to attend today. Uh, we'll ju just adjourn for five minutes, if that's okay. All rise. The Royal Commission will now adjourn.
The Royal Commission into Defence of Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Good morning, Mr Connor. Commissioners, I call Professor Ed Heffernan. Dr Heffernan, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Operator, might you display Professor Ed Heffnan tender bundle, please? Might you display page two of the tender bundle, please, Operator? Commissioners, I tender uh, items one to 10 as shown as displayed. Thank you. They'll be accepted as exhibits and assigned the next exhibit number in the order in which they appear in the, uh, in the list. In relation to items three and four on the list, Commissioners, uh, they are presently not for publication uh, uh, with a copyright issue. We so order. Operator, might you display exp.0001.0025.0025 0024. Professor, you received your or graduated in medicine in from the University of Queensland in 1994. Yes. You then undertook, um, after a period of residency, undertook your training as a psychiatrist. That's correct. And you became a fellow uh, of the college in 2002. Yes. You have um, completed a Masters of Public Health in 2010. Yes. In 2016, you completed a PhD. Yes. What was the topic of your PhD? Uh, my PhD was looking at the mental health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in custody. And you've, you've had a continuing focus on uh, people in custody in your work? Yes. Now, you're currently director of the Queensland Forensic Mental Health Services? Yes. Uh, you are an associate professor at the University of Queensland? That's correct. And you are also a psychiatrist in the Australian Army Reserves? Yes. And you've been in the, uh, had that role for the last five years. That's correct. And you've now hold the position of major. Yes. Now, what have you done in your role as a medical officer within, within the uh, Army Reserves? So I've had several roles. So I, the first really has been around the clinical work. Uh, so I've done some work for the ADF Centre for Mental Health uh, through Joint Health Command, um, through the Second Opinion Clinic. Uh, so that involves doing clinical assessments of uh, defence members um, who medical officers might be having or other psychiatrists uh, might be having some challenges with in terms of diagnostic or management issues. I've also uh, supported uh, one of the uh, full-time psychiatrists in defence for some cover, and so I've done some full-time work covering um, with Joint Health Command Central Australia. Uh, so that's some of the clinical work that I've done. I've also done some training work in mental health, so that includes uh, the, suicide, the mandatory annual suicide prevention training, other mental health awareness training topics. Uh, for example, last week uh, I provided some suicide and violence risk assessment training to uh, Garrison Health, medical officers, psychologists and uh, mental health nurses. Uh, I've also been involved in some research areas uh, with um, 
and involving ADF members and veterans. You were also the Director of the Police Communications Mental Health Liaison Service? Yes. And you've also been a medical consultant to the Australian Human Rights Commission? Yes. Now, you've, you've been the principal investigator in an important project known as Partners in Prevention, Understanding and Enhancing First Responses to the Suicide Crisis Situation. Yes, that's right, with a big team um, involved. Now, operator, might you display exp.001.0025 dot zero one four four. This professor is the summary report. So this is part of this, the summary report of the study that was carried out. Yes, there are um, four uh, technical reports from various areas and they're all summarised in this one report. Operator, might you display quickly exp.001.0025.0124 so that so knowledge, skills, attitude, and confidence. Uh, of police. Operator, might you go back to the previous document and display dot 0145? Might you display the bottom half of the page or the bottom two thirds of the page, please, operator? Now, this involved the Queensland Government, the Queensland Police Service, the organisation known as Roses in the Ocean, and the Queensland Alliance for Mental Health. Uh, yes, that's for one of the reports. Uh, other partners in this were Queensland Mental Health Commission, Queensland Ambulance Service, the PHN, uh, and probably others that I haven't mentioned right now. Now, a second uh, report, and I won't take you to this, Commissioners, but just give a reference for the transcript. It is at exp.0001.0025.0024. And it is the data linkage study. The third, exp.0001.0025.0068, and it's the optimal care pathways study. The next reference, exp.0001.0025.0100. And that, Professor, is the perspectives from lived experience have component of the study. Yes. Would you mind just speaking very broadly about that for a minute? Yes, I, I will. Um, I think probably as uh, the Commission has clearly acknowledged um, that lived experience is incredibly important in, uh, in research um, that involves people who either have suicidality or have died from suicide. Uh, and this report uh, was based on a workshop or several workshops conducted by several of my colleagues with um, a group of people who had lived experience um, and the idea was to obtain qualitative information that related to 
their experiences of suicide crisis and to provide uh, responses as to how uh, they felt uh, the first response to a suicide crisis should be dealt with. Operator, might you display the first uh, set of documents again, exp.001.0025.0021. Now, Professor, we might move through six subtopics, as it were. The first is um, suicide and suicidality. Operator, might you go to page in this set, dot zero one eight six. Professor, would you mind speaking to this topic? Yes, so I just wanted to discuss um, with the Commission um, something that I'm sure they're aware of, but es essentially um, the importance of being able to reconcile uh, data and information about suicidality uh, and information about suicide death. Um, and why, why I think that's important is that suicide death is an endpoint, but there is um, a um, process by which people reach that endpoint, and one of the proxy measures for that is suicidality, and perhaps we could consider it a measure of psychological distress. Um, it's important because we know that most suicide deaths are preceded by suicidality. Suicidality includes suicide ideation, suicide plans and attempts. And so suicidality offers an opportunity for intervention and prevention. And you emphasise there that a prior suicide attempt is the, most, the single most important risk factor for yes. suicide in the general population. That's a finding from the World Health Organisation um, in relation to you know, their estimate of 800,000 um, people dying annually from suicide. Now, there is, of course, a very significant paper Well, Mr. Connell's getting that. Uh, Professor, could you tell me what the ratio of 20 to 1 means on that slide? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. So that's the estimation that the World Health Organization had um, between suicide attempts and suicide deaths, just indicating, I guess, that there is a, a large number of um, suicide attempts that offer an opportunity for intervention. Um, some of which do not go on to, or many of which do not go on to suicide deaths, which is a very important piece of information because, of course, there might be learnings in that. Thank you. Operator, might you display the uh, exp.0001.0015.0015 Five six four. Professor, this is the Sadler et al. Australian New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry recent publication. Might you display the top half of the two thirds of the page, please, operator? Now you'll next come to speak of suicidality and the Australian Defence Forces, and you speak to um, information emerging from this, this study. Commissioners, one sees in methods here at the foot of methods, reference to two fundamental uh, studies. Um, the 2010 Australian Defence Force Mental Health Study and the Wellbeing Prevalence Study and the 2015 uh, Transition and Wellbeing Research uh, Program, known as the TWERP. Now, 
Now, um, operator might you display back in the original, the, the previous um, reference, that is exp.0001.00, and come to dot o zero one eight seven. And would you mind speaking to this? And yes, there's just a, a point I wanted to make from um, this particular table in this particular paper, which was published recently, and I think a very good and useful summary of information um, around suicidality and um, suicide uh, deaths related to current and ex-serving members. And I think the important thing I wanted to point to was just table one, um, the prevalence of uh, suicidality, um, which was estimated to be higher amongst the serving cohort in the ADF um, versus the general population. Uh, so if we go just looking at the bottom line there and go to the total for simplicity, and you'll see that the um, prevalence of suicidality amongst the ADF was estimated to be 4%, whereas for the general population, 1.8%. Um, I think this is important, and I think it's important because if we think about the continuum of distress with suicide being the end point, it helps us understand that some of the, um, I guess, apparent complexities or dichotomies in, in the standardised mortality ratios uh, that were evident in suicide deaths uh, through the AIHW uh, papers. And, and so um, to explain that a bit more simply, there is a protective factor that's apparent from um, being in defence. Suicide rates are substantially lower than compared to the general community. But in the transition period and for veterans, the rates appear and are um, higher than the general community. Um, I think just focusing on that could lead us to forget that some of the important clinical information, that is suicidality, um, and if we consider that it's a proxy measure for psychological distress, is apparent much earlier than the transition phase. And I just wanted to make the point to the Commission because I think it's important about how we think about mental health care and mental health services uh, that we have to think about this both in defence, in transition, and of course, when people are in the community. So being alert to mental health difficulties whilst a person is in the defence force itself. Yes, I think that's really important because it, it is a workforce that um, faces challenges um, that are unique um, to the work environment. The tempo of employment, um, deployment, trauma exposures, um, for example. Now, um, on the bottom of the foot left.
highlight that the majority of people weren't experiencing um, suicide ideation and that can be lost in the context of these discussions. What is happening between, are they the same group of people who are the 6.7% group versus the 13.2% group? As I understand it, it's the same, it, it is the same group. Um, I don't know, um, and it's not apparent from the paper whether it is the same people, but the same group has a higher proportion of people experiencing suicidality um, when measured at a later time, five years, than when measured um, at the first time in 2010. Now, might we move to the um, third subtopic or topic and the next slide, please? Would you speak to clinical experience of mental health and suicide crises? Yes, I, I just um, wanted to give the Commission some background about why I'm going to be speaking about the next topic that I will speak about, and that is. Um, that much of my work has related to mental health crisis and suicide crisis situations clinically, both in private and in public practice. Um, and one, one role in particular sees this. So I have worked in psychiatric emergency settings, in various forensic settings, um, and more recently over the past um, five to six years, very closely with first responders, particularly police, but also ambulance. Um, and we established a program uh, in the triple O call centres for police and ambulance. And so that picture is of a call centre, but it's a snippet of a call centre. And that's where all the triple O emergency calls come in. Uh, and then the picture below it is a clinician accessing databases, including Queensland Health's database, to share information with police under various protections, um, including a memorandum of understanding, um, to support first responders in responding to suicide crisis. As the clinical director of that service, uh, particularly initially when we set it up, I reviewed all of our contacts uh, every morning, and it became apparent to me that there was numbers well beyond what we had um, thought uh, would be occurring in terms of triple O calls related to suicide, that we didn't know much about these individuals, um, that in fact we weren't actually seeing um, much about those that were calling in terms of their healthcare pathways, um, that it seemed to be for very heterogeneous reasons that people were the subject of a triple O suicide related call. And it was, and they were getting various responses um, in, in relation to this. And the outcomes seemed to be very varied, but for the majority, we didn't even know what the outcomes were, or in fact, what the responses uh, were. So this, this was a um, situation where there were high numbers um, and we had very little understanding about who these individuals were, and in fact, how many of them there were on a daily basis. Um, that were the subject of triple O suicide related calls. And you then conducted the data linkage study concerning that? So yeah. that, that led to a piece of research which was to explore exactly those questions. And I think there was an average of 209 calls a day that you were exploring. Yes, so um, perhaps we could move to slides, but... To, um, to the next slide, please. So, This is the... Yes, yeah, so uh, I, I will perhaps explain the data linkage yeah. a bit later, but um, I think one of the things that is important that became apparent through the clinical work in that area was that some of these people were experiencing mental, health, uh, mental illness but not the majority. And in fact, the majority were, seemed to be experiencing psychosocial distress. Um, the research was necessary because there were lots of assumptions about what is the best way to respond.
but not really the evidence to inform how to respond or what actually people might need, whether they needed clinical services, whether they needed non-clinical services, whether they needed both, um, whether they needed peer-led services. It was, it was un, unclear to us. Um, and so that's why the, the research was important because limited resources need to be um, distributed in the most efficient way. Operator Mark, we move to the next slide, please. So, as I said earlier, um, this research was, uh, although led by me, was um, substantially um, carried out by a large team of people, which uh, in, you can see all the symbols there, and I've been through them, but um, the Queensland Government um, Suicide Prevention Task Force funded this research. Um, many partner organisations, um, including those with lived experience and ambulance and police. Operator, might you move to the next slide, please? We conducted a number of different areas of the study, including literature reviews, um, the um, perspectives from lived experience, which I talked about earlier, um, some service mapping, also surveyed knowledge, skills and attitudes of first responders. Um, but importantly, I wanted to talk about the data linkage study, and I'll explain how I think, you know, ultimately that relates to this particular commission yes. and some of the information that this commission might be seeking. Operator, might you proceed to the next slide, please? And might you speak about the uh, data link what, and what bodies of data were you exploring in this data linkage process? So data linkage is um, essentially a way of conducting research um, using routinely collected administrative data sets. So this data already exists, people collect it for various reasons, um, but you can use it if you uh, are able to link it and if you have um, a waiver of consent to use it and the indications are considered to be low risk to those that um, are the subject of the data entry. Uh, so having fulfilled all those requirements, we were able to um, link data. So we uh, identified the individuals that were the subject of triple O suicide calls to police or ambulance during a three year period. And we linked those individuals in a way that maintained their confidentiality that nobody saw who those individuals were, to mental health databases, alcohol and drug databases, hospital admission databases, emergency department uh, databases, death um, databases, to the perinatal database, and to the federal um, databases, the MBS and PBS. So it's a mix of state um, and federal records. And the, the purpose of that is we wanted to look at how many individuals were involved in suicide crisis or related to suicide crisis calls, who in fact they were um, from a demographics perspective, what were their health characteristics, so in the 12 months before the crisis, what happened in the crisis, and then what were the outcomes over the following 12 months. And we did this specifically to try and inform service delivery and improve how we were delivering services to people. If you go to the next slide. Thank you, operator. We were able to um, identify 220,000 calls um, for 70,000 individuals and link that to 7 million state health records and subsequently to 13 million federal records. So it's a massive data set. Um, and that data set uh, is now available to do some research, which I will talk about later, um, for um, defence members and veterans. Commissioners, Professor Heffernan's uh, paper reporting on this study is for transcript reference exp.0001.0013.0043. And it's a recent publication in the Australian New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry. 
And I Operator Mark, you proceed to the next page. So this is just to give um, the Commission an idea of the um, gravity of the situation. So on average, there were 111 calls per day during the three year period that we examined um, to ambulance that were suicide related and 98 calls to police. So um, over 200 calls a day, um, that's in Queensland. Uh, and that actually increased over the three year period quite significantly. So a really significant challenge really for first responders, for emergency departments, um, and for those involved in the, the care of the, these um, individuals. And my anecdotal experience is, um, you know, continuing to work in this area, is that this um, continues to be an increasing problem. Is, has any data been collected beyond 2017 in this domain? There is a, um, a further study replicating this um, that is currently at the beginning phase for um, the period 2017 to um, 2020, to the end of 2020. Operator, much proceed to the next page, please. So this was just to explain that within that data set, there are various cohorts that can be specifically examined. So for example, if someone was interested specifically to look at females, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, people who were born outside Australia, people who are under 18, people who are expectant mothers, it, the, the data linkage approach to epidemiological research gives you sufficient numbers to be able to have meaningful examination of sub cohorts within the bigger group and that's important because my experience, um, albeit very limited in working with defence, led me to think about uh, defence members and veterans as a cohort that may be represented in our group. Now, in the um, bottom right hand rectangle, would you mind explaining that? So in that particular group, we are linked to um, the National um, Death Index. Um, and so we know if people died uh, and 3.5% of the entire cohort did in fact die in the um, period that we examined after their index triple O related suicide call. And of those individuals, we have information a, that indicates they died due to intentional self-harm. So that will be a conservative estimate because there will be ongoing processes um, that would be subsequent to our examination. Yeah. Just to be clear about the time period, um, this is 3.5% uh, died within, is that the piece at the bottom, within 12 months of the first contact with Queensland Police or Queensland Ambulance? Yes. Is so it doesn't take into account deaths so, after, 12, after 12 months. That's right. So has that data been looked at the, within 24 months, within 36 months? So that data will be looked at. Um, it's an ongoing, ongoing process. Thank you, Professor. Operator, might you move to the next page, please? So I, I thought it was useful to explain just a, a, a tiny smattering of some of the health outcomes. So 96% of individuals that were um, the subject of a triple O related suicide call had contact with the emergency department. Um, and in fact, 70% of those on the day of the call. So that's a lot of people going to the emergency department. Uh, 84% of them had contact um, with mental health services, um, not necessarily on that day, um, but either in the 12 months before or the 12 months after uh, their, um, the index call. And interestingly, 
only 19% of those individuals had a confirmed mental health diagnosis. This would be a conservative estimate, but it highlights, I think, a really important issue. And that important issue is that mental illness is one of the components that relate to um, or, or might be a risk factor for suicide, but, but equally psychosocial distress. And I think it's important to think about mental health as a continuum, with good mental health at one end, poor mental health at another end, and contributors to poor mental health might include things like psychosocial distress, grief, loss, uh, and mental illness. But equally, people with mental illness, if they receive help, support and treatment, people with psychosocial distress um, can actually have good mental health. Compared to the other end of the continuum. And uh, what we also noticed was that people had a lot of service activity after their index call. That's important because it means there are opportunities for intervention. Now, the next slide, please, operator. So I felt there were some issues that were particularly relevant um, to veterans and um, defence members. And I think there are shared risk factors. Um, so that is um, things that would cause anyone psychosocial distress, loss of job, loss of structure, uh, relationship breakup, um, for example, mental illness, for example, but there are probably also unique risk factors um, that impact on defence and veteran members, including the things I mentioned earlier, um, you know, the particular nature of the work, which can be extremely stressful, um, and the particular exposures that people might be at risk of because of the work that they do. I also think that the um, heterogeneous nature of this problem is important um, and that's reflected in the things that I just said in that people uh, may need clinical services um, but our experience has been that people also need um, access to a variety of other services so for example with defence and veterans members um, it, it might be the non-government supports the peer-led services organisations like Open Arms, but I do think it's it's not a clinical or non-clinical, I think it's a clinical and non-clinical, um, you know, require, uh, need. Taking the general population, and I know you may not have data that um, supports an idea, but, um, and you spoke of um, people with a mental illness and others having psychosocial difficulties that don't have a mental illness. Have you a broad feel about what proportion of the um, population undergoing suicidality are in those two groups? Right. So there was a study, the, the, the ASRAP or, um, in, in Queensland um, last year, I think, um, provided information around that area indicating that 49% of people that had died from suicide in 2018 um, had been diagnosed with a mental illness. I think the important thing in this is not necessarily to look at the cross-sectional data, but to think about people having a kind of dynamic flow in a pathway. So people can have psychosocial distress and develop mental illness. People can have mental illness that's perfectly well treated, but have something that causes them psychosocial distress. So I think this is, this is why um, having the capacity for assessment uh, is really important because somebody that has a relationship breakup, for example, and has a lot of distress, might actually go on to develop a major mental disorder, not having experienced one before. Um, alternatively, they may not, but may experience extreme 
distress from whatever their variable was that impacted on their life. So not people, putting people in boxes, as it were, but understanding that the whole situation is dynamic yes, and, and influenced by many, many matters. That's correct. And in the individual's own circumstances. That's correct. And the important issue is, is having access to you know, assessment and interventions. Operator, might you move to the next page, please? So I wanted to um, indicate that the data linkage study that has the 220,000 calls, 70,000 individuals, 7 million health records and the 13 million federal records, is, um, I see it as one giant database. Um, in there, are bound to be, and in fact we know there are, defence members and veterans. So there will be important information in this data uh, about defence members and veterans. Now, how do we access that information? Well, currently we can, we can access it by looking at account class code, so that's if people paid with a card, a white card, a gold card, or an orange card at some stage during the course of their health engagement in the period that we examined. It's not a good measure. It's a kind of proxy measure. Of, um, it may even pick up family members, um, but it doesn't tell us um, a great deal and it's likely to be conservative. So that's a mechanism, not the best mechanism. The second mechanism that we now have um, is by looking at prescribing. Um, so this is by looking at the RPBS, which is the repatriation prescribing. So again, it's an okay mechanism, but what about if people aren't prescribed medication, for example, or a prescribed medication um, not through the RPBS system? Um, so both these are things that we could do now, um, but they're not ideal, and they'll be, I would say, um, probably missing quite a few individuals and perhaps not tell us the level of detail that we need. But if we go to the next slide. Thank you, Operator. Myself and the colleagues that are listed um, on that slide Duncan Wallace, Carla Merck, John Lane, Diana Mackay and Andrew Koo um, have undertaken a research project over the last two years um, in collaboration um, with a number of uh, organisations um, that's being funded by the Defence Health Foundation. It has um, Department of Defence and Veteran Affairs um, Research Ethics Committee approval. It has in principle approval from Joint Health Command and the Defence People Group. And the idea is to link the PM Keys database and the Defence Electronic Health System records um, to um, this already detailed, um, well-constructed um, data set. And so that will then um, provide the gold standard of linkage. That's at the last stage of linkage, so unfortunately I don't have for the Commission um, that information yet. Uh, it has one more hurdle to jump, uh, and I would say because we've got such a well-groomed data set, the linkage is likely to be less troublesome than most linkages, and then there would be data available on that relates to current serving members, all de-identified, all with protections around it from research ethics committees, Public Health Act um, and veterans um, that would tell us important things. And I might go through some of the questions that we, we could answer um, in the next slide. Might you proceed to the next slide, please? A 
Okay, so that, that's the one. Um, so uh, perhaps back to that previous one. How will this be useful, please? The previous slide. So Got what it. we what we um, will be able to answer is questions about prevalence. So how many individuals are the subject of triple O suicide related calls, the split between current serving and veteran members, gender differences, age differences. Uh, we'll be able to compare that to the non-defence cohort and the non-veteran cohort. So we've got a, a comparison group, could be um, well compared. We can look at the healthcare pathways for individuals, both in the defence, public and private systems. Um, admissions, um, emergency department presentations, prescribing, outcomes, what the first response was, what happened after the first response. Um, we can look at variables like employment, um, deployment, uh, and um, I think Ultimately, we can even sort of drill down further into more complex issues like, and I think this is important, um, correlates of positive outcomes where things actually go well. Next slide, please, operator. So I think, when, when might this emerge, this information? Well, it, it really relates to the last step um, and, the, and um, I think the last step will be resolved in the um, or at least we'll have an indication of its resolution in the next week. Uh, and then the information would emerge over the subsequent um, six to 12 months, uh, assuming that um, all the analysis can be done. Uh, and so our hope is that we can fulfil the ethical and legal obligations to enable and the analysis requirements to enable that information to be provided to the Commission. Um, I think that there are some really important things that will, will come out from this research. I think one of the things is we focus really heavily on um, outcomes. Uh, and I think that we have to remember that, you know, amongst our defence members and our veterans, there's enormous strengths. And many of these difficulties actually result in a positive outcome. So what makes the difference um, is, a, I think, a really good question um, and something that we can focus on. I think prescribing patterns, and uh, there's a lot of polypharmacy, which it, the Commission may have heard about, um, which is a real problem. Um, there's a lot of comorbid conditions, health conditions. Um, and amongst this group, we can in investigate those questions. And I think the gender differences, um, and particularly given the limited information we have about uh, female suicidality and female death amongst defence and veteran members, um, there's an opportunity to find out a bit more about that. Why would we want to know this information? I think it's really important information in terms of how we provide interventions. Um, so most of the people that are involved in this um, are not research experts. They're mostly people that run services or have a specific interest in um, defence or veteran mental health. So that's our focus. Um, is, is DVA or defence involved in any element of delay? causing any delay in this emerging stuff, or is it um, other ethics and contractual? I think any data linkage study takes a long time because there's a lot of hurdles to jump, and rightly so. You know, people govern bodies of information. Essentially, the information is loaned to us to examine, and people are responsible for that. Um, Yes, there, it has been um, a long process, um, but I think we're reaching the end of that it, process. It, the process depends on Commonwealth departments to some extent. Uh, well, there, there, there will be a couple of really critical steps. Uh, there's one important process that involves 
defence um, and um, I guess legal consideration about the um, administrative database, uh, which is an important question for defence. And there's a, a um, an information agreement is the is the technical term of the last step that we're waiting on. Uh, and then there'll be a step with the AIHW. So all of the data sits on a thing called the Shore platform with AIHW, which is a very secure, curated um, uh, data set in, that's monitored. Um, and so it will be migrating that data if the last step is approved, which I um, feel confident that it will be, uh, migrating that data onto the Shore platform. Now that can happen really quickly, or we can join a long queue along with billions of other studies. Um, I believe that um, that uh, there might be a, a bit of a queue, but uh, that will determine on negotiations with the AIHW. Uh, next slide, please. And whilst we're waiting for the next slide, you, you've had deep experience in the prison area. Um, you able to offer any observations about veterans and in, in prison systems? Have you come across that in? Yeah, so from a research perspective, there's very little that helps us understand that. But from a clinical perspective, I've been working in prisons in um, Queensland um, and, in, and I've worked in Victoria. I've certainly seen um, veterans in prisons. I've seen um, mem defence members in, in prison. I've provided um, treatment and care to uh, individuals in prison. I think many of the same issues um, that exist in the community exist in that setting. Um, and that is um, clinicians, I guess, having a cultural understanding of um, what that individual's experiences might be. We don't know uh, a great deal about what the, for want of a better word, prevalence of um, veterans might be uh, in uh, correctional settings. However, uh, we will uh, be able to find that information out through a planned data linkage to this data linkage, which is um, with the Corrective Services database. But that's a couple, uh, perhaps a, a year or two off. Might you address, this is um, Professor's final slide, might you speak to this and if the commissioners have got any further questions. Yeah, so I, I guess just sort of, I've spoken a lot about research, but also I thought it was important to um, talk about my clinical experience working in this area and sort of try and pull the two uh, together, and I think, um, you know, I think for prevention, I mean, one of the things we need to focus on is what are the, what are the needs of of that individual. And I've already spoken to, I think, the needs of actually having um, recognising that that this is a heterogeneous problem, and so having heterogeneous responses, so clinical and non-clinical responses, and having some coordination over that, and having those responses uh, available in real time. And that's something that we're certainly working on um, in, in our service, is how do we link individuals in crisis up to the thing that they actually need um, at that time? Because often sitting in an emergency department for four or five hours when you have psychosocial distress and not necessarily a major mental disorder may not be a great outcome for an individual. And as we saw, many of the, many of the individuals in suicide crisis do go to the emergency department pathways. I think that there's also an element, you know, in prevention about access to services, and I've talked about this earlier. And I think one of the things um, I've noticed in my my experience as a reserve psychiatrist uh, is that the supply demand curve is is way out of kilter, um, in that the demand for uh, mental health assessments, mental health intervention. Um, seems to be much higher than, than the supply. And I'll, I'll acknowledge that I'm specifically speaking now about psychiatric services, as that's my field, yes. recognising that many, many other people provide mental health care. 
Um, and I think, you know, that's uh, when I spoke to Garrison Health, for, for example, um, that was something that was highlighted, um, that, that there are limited, um, limited availab availability of psychiatrists. There are psychiatrists that are both in uniform. So let's say there are two full-time psychiatrists with the ADF, uh, and there are, I think, um, well, my estimate, which is probably wrong, but um, eight reserve psychiatrists, potentially more around the country. Uh, so there are some psychiatry resources, and I think probably being able to mobilise those psych psychiatry resources, particularly the reserve ones, I don't think the problem exists for the full-time ones. I think they're very busy and well utilised. I think perhaps the reserve psychiatrists are a, um, a body that's not utilised um, to the extent that they, they could be. I think they could be involved in transition planning. Um, I also think um, that there is an area of challenge um, for Garrison Health, and I'm talking about the jurisdiction that I know about, but maybe this exists in other jurisdictions. And I think that challenge is, if you have somebody in crisis, how do you navigate that complex system called the mental health system? How do you get somebody into that? And it is actually really difficult. Um, and I mean, one of the things that I think would be useful um, would be to have a connection uh, in the same way that perhaps we do, whether it's a, whether this is designed structurally or whether this relies on individuals. Uh, but there seems to be a very good um, connection between the public health systems um, and uh, defence systems for physical health, um, perhaps, but perhaps not um, as uh, strong for mental health. And I think that's an evolving thing. Um, so if we go back a few years, the, the number, th that number of psychiatrists, which is a small number, um, would have been less. Um, so I think having some um, developed system between the public health system and the um, garrison health system is probably really important for particularly mental health crisis situations. Um, I think that workforce and um, workforce training is really important and I've, I've sort of thought about some recommendations around that, which I'd be happy to speak to. Uh, and perhaps I'll leave that there and maybe talk about some of the things I think might be useful um, for the Commission to consider. So in terms of things that I thought might be useful recommendations, um, I think um, I'd be really keen for the Commission to um, continue, or the Commission team, I should say, to continue to maintain contact around the progress of our research so that we could make that available to the Commission when it is possible to do so. We certainly will, Professor. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of uh, training initiatives, so having been involved in some of training both um, of registrars and psychiatrists around this area and um, defence members around this area. I think there's been some really good training initiatives in defence and there's some really good programs. Um, and so building on, on that work, I think more mental health awareness training. Um, one of the areas that we've worked with in a lot of big systems where there are individuals that face particularly challenging work environments that have large exposure to trauma is um, thinking about trauma-informed practice uh, and providing trauma-informed um, training programs. Uh, and so I think that might be something that the Commission might be interested in, in considering for the, um, particularly the defence health workforce, but maybe the workforce more broadly. Um, I, was, I, I also think that um, we've done a lot of training with first responders about responding to mental health crisis. And this has included developing um, some training videos which have top tips about how to interact with someone who is experiencing suicide or um, distress. Um, 
with some lived experience videos that we've developed. Uh, there's some uh, video content specifically designed for ambulance and police officers about how to engage in difficult conversations around suicide distress. And I think that would be good for the Commission team to have a look at to see whether there's some applicability to um, uh, the defence workforce. Um, I've mentioned uh, the Garrison Health, but I think exploring the needs of Garrison Health. There's some brilliant medical officers, psychologists, mental health nurses, um, who I think would be you know, really important to um, for the Commission to hear from, yes. uh, if they haven't already. I notice the time there, Professor. Do you, do you notice, is, is it okay to proceed for a few minutes, or are you, are you having to... uh, I'm just, yeah, right at the very end, I think. Um, and I, th I think the, probably the last thing which I just touched on was, um, you know, working, um, you know, working with defence to explore the structural or, or, or governance enhancements that might actually enable better utilisation of that um, reserve psychiatrist workforce. Do you have a minute or two to take some questions from the commissioners if they have any? We'll be brief, Dr Heffernan. We're aware of your time constraints. Yes, apologies for that. No, no need to apologise. Um, thanks, um, Dr Heffernan. I have two quick questions, hopefully. The first one is, you're looking at triple O calls in Queensland. I'm wondering whether it's possible to do the same research looking at the calls to the defence after hours crisis line. Yes, I think that would be possible. And that would be a, potentially a different or perhaps overlapping cohort, yeah. but it would be interesting. Yes, yeah, so I imagine there would be um, an administrative data set that records that information and it would be um, you know, the, the, the same governance process of being able to enable that to be released and then it could link um, with the, as long as there were some identifiers, yeah. um, then it could link with the with the data set. Yeah. And I and think I, that's I, a good I, idea, actually. Yeah, I don't know whether there is identifiers, but it's just a mm. thought struck me. The other question I wanted to ask was going back to looking at the data of the 12 months, after 12 months for the calls made to triple O. This is for suicidal ideation, wasn't it? They're suicide related calls. Su suicide related. Yeah. yeah. So the, the thing I wanted to focus in on is you said that 1.5% of those had died within 12 months of intentional self-harm, but 3.5% of people had died. So there's something else happening that people who are contacting with suicide related um, ideation plans, whatever, are dying of other things. Mm. Do you have any sense of what that's about and what, what we need to be thinking about there? Yeah, so um, probably the simple answer is no. Um, the more complex answer is that um, what we know about individuals uh, who um, experience suicide crisis is often there's significant health comorbidity. Uh, and so one thing that we haven't talked about a, um, a lot is substance misuse, for example. So the impacts of substance use, the impacts of chronic health, um, so com comorbid physical health problems, uh, and, um, and the sequelae, for example, of substance misuse like liver disease. And uh, so f there's uh, been a recent article from the States looking at um, veteran death using a concept which is a, a pretty miserable title called Deaths of Despair. And what it actually does is put together um, health diseases that are related to substance misuse, overdoses and suicide together um, and examines that as a group. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Davis? Can I just try to clarify what might happen in a normal circumstance, someone might ring triple O and say they have suicide related feelings uh, and with an identifier such as the mobile number they're ringing in on or their name, then trigger access to this database. So the operator could triage it in some way by saying, this is someone who's at real risk of suicide and will do the best 
possible in the in the available time? Um, so the, the so the research responses to triple O calls independent. Um, so someone will ring triple O and and they will be directed to either police, ambulance, fire, uh, and that individual will be responded to um, in accordance with either the protocols or um, their need, um, and that will trigger subsequent responses. Um, it may be that the call comes in uh, that from the individual themselves, but not infrequently it comes in from an organisation like Lifeline, or it might come in from a family member, or it might be that a family member has seen a text or a Facebook message, so there are a variety of pathways in, and then the responses um, come from the emergency services. And, and when do they get into the data set? To... So, that, so um, when those individuals are um, uh, a call, they, they are logged into a data set, and we had to go into those data sets and mine those data sets for suicide related things. So some are coded directly as suicide, but others are not coded. So people much smarter than myself built algorithms to pull all that information out. Um, but your question leads to something that I think is really important, which is real time monitoring. That's what I was really mm. thinking of. Mm. And would a similar process be triggered if somebody came to an emergency department? Uh, so if somebody um, presents to an emergency department, yeah, similarly their, their data is held in an administrative data set and that's how we were able to link to that. And is real-time monitoring obviously on your horizon? Do you expect to be able to do it in the near future? Um, yeah. Um, it, 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 I think it would be good to be able to do it. There are ways to do it. There are definitely ways to do it, but it's, it requires resourcing and it requires um, agreements. Um, but and, and yes, it is, it is on the horizon. And in fact, it's a discussion that has already taken place with the Queensland Mental Health Commission, with um, ASRAP in Queensland and um, with the um, Mental Health Alcohol and Other Drugs branch. And um, there are people that are very interested in that because it enables you to see, particularly you know, in this kind of period where you know, COVID has impacted many things, What's changing? What do we need to know? Who is the demographic? Who's at risk? What areas are you know um, at risk? Uh, and so I think that's quite an important. That would be quite an important advance in this area. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Heaven, and we appreciate your time and the evidence you've given us today. And apologies if we've held you up uh, in relation to the, t the agreed time. No Commissioner, might thank you. Might Professor Heffernan be? Re released from... Yeah, you're released from your notice to attendance and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, we'll adjourn till 1.45. All rise. The Royal Commission will now adjourn.
The Royal Commission into Defence Merchant and Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Yes, good afternoon, Ms Bridget. Afternoon, Commissioners. May it please the Commission. On the 26th of November 2021, pursuant to Section 60, Subsection 3 of the Royal Commissions Act, 1902, the Commission made a direction in the form of a non-publication direction that the next witness not be identified in giving evidence and subsequently directing that the witness be referred to using a pseudonym, namely BR1. Noting this direction, Commissioners, I formally call our witness, Witness BR1. But before the Associate administers the affirmation, I note that the witness's testimony may trigger or cause some distress to those listening who have experienced abuse. I mention this now to afford those who may be triggered or find the evidence distressing the opportunity to not, list, to not listen to the evidence if they so wish. Thank you, yes. Witness BR1, please respond with I do after the wording of the affirmation. Witness BR1, do you solemnly declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank, Thank you. you. Witness, you made a confidential statement to the Royal Commission dated 8th of December 2021, is that correct? Yes. To the best of your knowledge and belief, are the contents of your straight statement true and correct? Yes. Commissioners, I tender that statement as a statement of witness BR1 dated 8th of December 2020 with the document ID WIT.0001.0011.0001 Thank you. It will be accepted as an exhibit and allocated the next exhibit number. I'm grateful, Commissioner. Witness, if at any stage you need to take a break please let me know. And if you do not want to answer any of the questions that I ask you, you do not need to answer them. Thank you. Is it correct that you are giving evidence today to provide insight into what you experienced during your service in the Navy? Yes. And you are giving evidence to provide insight into what you had to go through to get help for mental health issues and the suicidal thoughts you were experiencing during your service. Is that correct? Yes. And is it correct that you are giving evidence because you do not want any other woman or man to experience the things that you went through? Is that correct? Yes. You served in the Royal Australian Navy for a total of five and a half years. Is that correct? Yes. And you currently remain in the Australian Reserves? Yes. How old were you when you joined the Navy? I was 17. And before you joined, were you still at school or had you left? No, I was in Year 12. Had you completed Year 12? No. And how did you get interested in joining the Navy? Um... Uh, some recruitment officers came to my school when they spoke um, and I got interested when they came to my school. And can you recall anything about that day when they came to your school? Um, it was a good day. Like, it, they made it sound quite exciting and inviting and something that I wanted to do. And can you describe for the Commission your first night at the Naval Base? Um... It wasn't very nice. Um, I got there. Um, I hadn't left home. Well, I'd never been out of home before, lived out of home before. Um, and when I got there, I unpacked what I needed to unpack and I had a shower and I got in my pyjamas and I went to go use my phone um, and I left where I was meant to be sleeping and I got yelled at straight away um, because I wasn't meant to be where I was in my pyjamas. Can you recall what they said? Um, no, they just said that I wasn't meant to be out there in my pyjamas. They screamed at you, is that right? Yeah. And did things improve for you during your initial training? Uh, no, not really. 
Definitely. And where did you do your initial training? Um, at HMA Cerberus. And when you say they didn't improve, can you please tell the Commission what happened? Um, usually during uh, fitness training or exercises, I would get yelled at um, if I couldn't complete the task that was expected of me. Um, a lot of the male PTIs would um, say, yell at me, and then if I got upset, they would say that I was worthless and I'm not meant to be here. Um, and then sometimes we'd line up outside of our building um, and I'd be smiling and I'd get in trouble from the leading seamen as I was smiling um, and I'd be asked to go and do bull rings. So I would be running inside uh, the recruitment area um, because I was smiling and if I didn't stop smiling, I would continue running. Um, and a lot of the time I would get um, the daily limit. I can't exactly remember how many it was, but I would do a lot. And you got that for smiling, is that right? Yes. And yeah. you referred to the acronym PT. Can you tell the Commissioner what you mean by PT? Uh, physical trainers. And were they male or female physical trainers? Um, mostly male. There was only one female that I remember, but it was the males that used to yell at me. And can you call anything else about what occurred during this training? Um, well, there was a few occasions where um, the, the girls in my room uh, would lock me outside of my room um, so I would have nowhere to sleep. Um, so I ended up failing some tests and um, PT tests because I hadn't had any sleep um, the night before because I had nowhere to sleep. And during this time, were you able to contact your parents? Uh, yes, I would ring my parents um, every night because I was 17, so I was able to call them um, and I would cry and ask to come home. And my mum wanted me to come home, but my dad sort of thought, didn't really know what was going on and just thought it was just me trying to get out of it. So he said that it'd probably be best if I stuck it out. So at this stage you were feeling like you wanted to leave? Yes, yeah. And when you were told that you were worthless, can you recall the impact that this had on you at that time? Um, it made me I like upset. Sometimes I would cry and so I would get yelled at even more because I was crying. And can you recall whether you were eating or sleeping okay during this time? Um I wasn't eating a lot, no, because um, I would not be able to complete the fitness tasks. I'd have to do um, additional, like, remedial practice um, late in the afternoon and the leading seaman that was on duty would take us for dinner after and he told us that when he stands up, uh, we had to finish eating so we could get back to our building and most of the times when he stood up, I'd only just got my food, so I didn't actually have a chance to sit down and eat anything because he was already up and moving, so I just had to put my food in the bin. So is it the case that you, weren't, you were not allowed to finish your dinner once he got up to leave? Is that, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And what would you end up eating that night? Um, it would just be food that I could get um, from the like little shop inside the where we were as recruits. So I'd buy like tuna and crackers or chocolate or chips, whatever I could buy. I usually would just eat that. And can you recall the first time that your family visited you? Uh, yes. Well, a lot of them didn't really recognise me because my clothes didn't really fit me anymore. There wasn't really much left, I guess, of me. I was very skinny. Because you had lost weight? And because yeah. you weren't eating? Yeah. A few, a few days before you left for your first deployment, you went out with a group of shipmates in the city where the ship was docked. Is that correct? Yes. And to the extent that you want to, can you tell the Commission what happened that night? Um, well, there was a group of us um, and we got, like, a few rooms, like, in like a share I guess like a share house so there was it was like a house but there was different rooms in there so we all 
um, stayed there because it was too far to go back to the ship, so we were staying out for the night. Um, and we went out and we had a few drinks and um, I honestly didn't drink that much. I only remember getting by myself two drinks and having one drink before I had left. Um, there was a, someone, a fellow shipmate, that was buying drinks for the group of us and um, I'm not sure how much was in those drinks, but I do remember once I, well, when I woke up that I had, I was being sexually assaulted when I woke up from going out. And witness, what did you do that morning? Um, I just, once I had woken up and I felt okay, um, I just got up and I left and I went to my friend's place um, and I just felt like upset and I, I didn't tell anyone, I just left. So you didn't tell your friend that morning, is that right? Yes. And is it the case that you were sexually assaulted by a fellow shipmate? Yes, yes. He was someone that I worked with. And you didn't confide in anyone uh, that, that morning about the assault, is that correct? No, I didn't. And in between the time from then and when I left for my deployment, I didn't tell anybody. And how old were you when you were sexually assaulted by a fellow shipmate? I just turned 18. And during the course of your service witness, in particular after your first deployment, did you try and get help and support after you'd been sexually assaulted? Um, not, no, not, not straight away. Um, I didn't really know who to go to and I sort of felt like it was my fault and I didn't know if anyone would believe me. Um, but during my deployment I did ask, I did um, confide in somebody and I did get some help. And I'll, I'll ask you some questions about that in a moment. But in the times where you did try, this is after your first deployment, when you tried yeah. to get some help, can you recall some of the things that you were told? Um, I was told by some people that um, they don't like, defence doesn't like paperwork, um, people don't like doing paperwork, um, that some people had told me that no one would believe me um, because it was he, like it would be him against me and it, I'm a woman um, and some people told me that my career was ruined because I couldn't shut my legs. And were those things said to you by other people in the Navy? Yes, they were um, people that were my chain of command, so they were meant to, I guess, be there for me and look after me, and that's the things that they said to me. And a few days after the sexual assault, you left for your first deployment, is that correct? And yeah. at this stage you hadn't told anyone about the sexual assault, is that right? Yeah. And your first deployment lasted approximately three months? Yes. And what, what, is, what is the first deployment referred to in the Navy? Um, well, this posting for me was, it was like a sea ride, so it was just, um, I was posted to a ship as an extra, pretty much just to gain experience um, for myself. And how did you find everyone when you first set out to sea? Um, they were all really nice, really friendly. I felt like I, I fitted in. And how did you find the work on there? Well, it was, it was hard. Um, I guess I wasn't expecting to be as hard as it was, but we weren't really overworked. It was understood um, that we were only there as an extra. So. And what happened at about a month after the deployment? or a month into the deployment, I should say? Um, I just sort of broke down and I felt like overwhelmed and really upset um, because I, I was, I guess, dealing with a sexual assault prior by myself, so I just felt quite upset. 
And did you manage to speak to anyone at this stage? Um, yeah, I got upset and I began to cry and they, the leading seaman that was on board um, just sort of asked if I was okay um, and I just said I, I wasn't okay and I wasn't too sure where to start talking about it. Um, and he didn't push me to talk. Um, he, We just sort of started doing a task together like, um, to sort of distract from what I was thinking and um, during that time I just started to, I, I guess, calm down a little bit and I just told him that something had happened before I left um, and he just asked if I was comfortable, if it would be okay if he just shut the door because he felt like it was going to be a private conversation. He didn't want other people to hear it um, and I told him, that I was sexually assaulted um, by a shipmate and um, he said that it wasn't okay that it happened and that he was um, concerned that he couldn't provide me with the support I needed and felt that I needed to go talk to somebody. And did he organise anything for you? Um, yeah, he spoke to someone else in the chain of command, a female, um, and he helped organise um, for me to go see a psychologist when we would um, pull in on our port visits. And did you see a psychologist? Yeah, it was uh, two or three times. That was whilst you were at port, is that right? Yeah, so when we would pull alongside, that's when I would speak to somebody. And had you disclosed the sexual assault to the psychologist at that time? I, yeah, I did mention it, yeah, but I didn't go into much detail. I just mentioned that it had happened. And was the psychologist that you saw a member of the Navy or an independent psychologist? Um, no, they were a defence psychologist. A defence psycho psychologist. And when you spoke to the psychologist at that time, did the psychologist offer any support to you in terms of reporting the sexual assault? Not, no, not really. Um, she was just trying to um, provide me with the support I needed to, I guess, deal with how I was feeling. Um, but no, there wasn't anything provided about um, reporting it, no. And what happened on the ship after you had disclosed the sexual assault to the leading seaman and at this time you were receiving some support from the psychologist? What happened once you got back on the ship? Um, sometimes I would have, um, I would get upset again and I would sit down with this leading seaman and I would have a conversation about things and, again, the door would be closed because it is a quite private conversation that I didn't want everybody to know and a member of the ship um, created a story um, insinuating that there was something going on between myself and this leading seaman. Um, so I got um, sat down, like myself and the leading seaman got sat down with the PO and I was told that um, I should know that he's married and he has a family um, and that I shouldn't be engaging in these sorts of things. Um, you mentioned PO, so I, witness. What does PO stand for? A petty officer. And when you were sat down, were you asked for your side of the story? Uh, I wasn't, no. I did t eventually tell my side of the story um, to which the PO felt. Um, I get, he apologised for, I guess, believing what was said. Um, but, again, it didn't really stop everything that was said on the ship. It just continued to get worse. How did it get worse, witness? Um, they just kept talking about us and saying that... Um, we were engaging in sex on board the ship and off the ship. Um, so it just created a, like a negative feeling for myself um, and I just didn't really talk about it anymore because I just felt like I'd bought this on myself. And is it correct that the leading seaman who you disclosed your sexual assault 
to was someone that you had trusted at that time. Is that correct? Yes, Roy well, is the first person I ever told about what happened to me. And if I can call them rumours, how did the rumours impact on you regarding the issues of trust? Um, I just felt like I couldn't trust anyone anymore, um, especially inside defence. I just felt like um, it didn't matter what you did. Someone always had a different view on what you'd done. And did the rumours have any impact on your career in the Navy? Um, yeah, well, it did in particular to this posting um, because uh, it was, like I said, it was a sea ride, so it was an opportunity to get gain experience. Um, and they offered people the opportunity to stay on and it become like a, a posting, like a permanent position. Um, and I was told that, they liked my work ethic and everything like that, but because of the rumours, they couldn't keep me on board the ship. And so then what happened? Um, so then I was posted back to where I was sexually assaulted. And how were you feeling at that time? Um, not very good. Um, I felt alone because... I was far away from family. I didn't know anybody over there. Um, I was living by myself. Um, I just felt really low and I was just having um, some very um, horrible thoughts about um, ending my life because it felt like it didn't matter how, much, how many times I asked for help. It was always my fault. Witness, we can take a break if you would like to have a five-minute break or would you like me to continue? I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay, thank you. Did your family know at this stage about the sexual assault? No. Did they know that you were feeling this alone and suicidal? No. Did anybody else know that you were feeling alone and suicidal? No. And so you were completely alone at this stage, is that right? Yes. Were you receiving any support, professional support at this time? Uh, yes, I was seeing um, another uh, defence psychologist. And was it around this time that you decided to report the sexual assault to the police? Yes. And how did you come to make that decision to report? Um, the psychologist had uh, suggested that a few times and I thought that maybe, um, I don't know, I thought maybe it might make me feel better if I did it and I guess somebody believed me. And what did the police say when you did report it? Um, not much. They just said um, that it was he said, she said, um, that I didn't really have any evidence to suggest that it did happen. Um, and they asked me uh, what was I wearing, what was I doing before it had happened. Um, and I proceeded to ask them what did they mean by that um, and they said that I could have given him the wrong idea. That's why it happened. Um, and I told them that I was wearing jeans and a T-shirt and tiny high heels and I said that um, even if I was wearing just a bikini, I don't think it's okay what happened to me. And, um I guess I just felt like that they were sort of insinuating that I was a woman, that being a woman I bought this on myself. Did you feel that they were implying it was your fault? Yeah. Did you feel silenced by this experience? Yeah, well, I, I didn't proceed with the report and I just said I just wanted to go because I didn't feel like this was helping me at all. 
And can you recall what you were thinking and feeling at this time? I just felt like it was my fault. And it just, I guess, made me spiral even deeper into the thoughts that I was already having because I already felt like it was my fault. So it was just, I guess, I guess implied again that it was my fault. And when you say thoughts, are you referring to suicidal thoughts? Yes. And did you reach out to anyone at this time? Um, uh, not straight away. Um, but I guess when they got worse, um, I don't know why, but all I wanted was my family. And I rang my mum. And I told my mum what had happened and I wasn't aware, but my family was in the car and I was on loudspeaker so everyone heard <laughs> what had happened, I guess, in one go. Um, and after I told them, my family organised to come and see me as soon as they could. And what did your mum do? Um, my mum found... SARC, which is the Sexual Assault and Rape Centre. She found me some information from them um, once she came over and I gave them a call. Did, did your mum say anything to you about what had happened? Um, she, didn't, she didn't say a lot. Um, she was upset. Um, she mainly just gave me a big hug and just told me that she would help me. And did she tell you that it was not right what had happened to you? Yeah. Yeah. And what did the woman that at the sexual assault and rape centre, what did the woman that you saw there, what did she say and do at the time? Um, well, she spoke with me and she told me that what had happened and how I'd been treated wasn't okay. Um, and she contacted SEMPRO. Um, can, can you just tell the Commission what, what SEMPRO stands for? Yeah. Um, it's the Sexual Misconduct and Prevention Office. Um, so they, um, they organised for me to get... Uh, an emergency placement to a different location. And at this point, were you still on the naval base where the perpetrator was? Yes. And you told this woman what had happened to you, is that right? Yeah. And did you know about these services at the time? Because you said that your mum found out about SARC and SEMPRO. Did you know about these services while you, while you, whilst you were in the Navy or before the Navy? No, I'd never heard of them before. And at this point, did you want to leave the Navy? Yes, I wanted to just run away. And did any of the information about what had happened to you whether that be the sexual assault, your appointments with SARC or SEMPRO, did any of that information get back to others in the Navy? Um, yes, I, I'm not sure to what extent of the information got back, but um, the chief, which is the chief petty officer, and the PO, which is petty officer, they received uh, the information about my posting um, and they were the only ones that were meant to know about it. And then I had some leading seamen and some able seamen um, asking me where I was going. And this was, when you say you're posting, this was the emergency posting that the, that the uh, Sexual Misconduct and Prevention Office had arranged for you, is that correct? Yes, yeah. And did they ask you why you were leaving? Yeah, they were asking why I was leaving. 
um, and I wouldn't tell them why I was leaving. Um, and again, I was told by these leading seamen and able seamen that um, no one likes paperwork um, and my career is going to go down the toilet because I'm creating paperwork. What else were you told? And I was also um, told that I bought this on myself. Can you can you say that again, please, witness? I brought this on myself. And did you stay at that base or did you leave? What happened after that? Um, I got posted to a, a different base after some time. Um, so I was moved to a different um, base away from uh, the person who sexually assaulted me. And what happened when you returned from leave before you were posted on your next deployment? Um, well, I when I got news that I had a new posting, um, the chief, uh, which is the chief B officer, um, told me I was going on a certain ship and I said that I couldn't go on that ship um, uh, because there was the, the perpetrator was on that ship. Um, so he told me that he would try and find um, another posting and find someone to fill my spot. And did the Navy know... Before making that po posting, did the Navy know, for example, was it on your paperwork that you were not to be posted with the perpetrator? Yes, it was flagged on my paperwork, yes. Yeah. And can you tell the Commission what happened in terms of anybody questioning you about why you weren't, weren't able to go on that ship? Um, yes, yeah, so after I had spoken to the chief B officer. Witness, I think we may have lost you there. Can you hear me? Commissioners, may I seek a brief adjournment to work out the technology? Certainly. We'll just take a five-minute adjournment until the uh, technology is restored. Thank you. All Thank rise. You. The Commission will now adjourn.
The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Ms Bridget. Thank you, Commissioners. Witness, can you hear me? Yes. Apologies for the technology dropping out. Witness, you were saying how it had been flagged on your paperwork that you were not to be posted with the perpetrator and that despite that, you were being posted on a ship with the perpetrator. Do you recall that? Yes. And then I asked you whether anything else had come up or any other questioning of you about why you were not to be posted on a ship or at the base with the perpetrator? Yes. And did anything like that happen? Um, yes, it did. Can you tell the Commission what happened? Um, so after I spoke to the Chief Petty Officer um, and he told me that he'd find someone else uh, for that posting and find me another one, um, the next day I was asked by the Petty Officer um, and he said that I had to go. I was, I was told by the Petty Officer that I had to go and that it couldn't be changed. Um, and I had said that I had spoken to the Chief um, about it and he said that he would sort it out. Um, the Petty Officer proceeded to question me further and ask me why I couldn't be posted with that person. Um, and I said that I didn't want to tell him the full details, I just can't be posted with that person. Um, and then I told the Chief later what the PO had asked and that I just said that I don't understand how I was told that um, he was going to find me a new posting and now the PO was saying that I had to go um, and he told me that if he was trying to find somebody else and he was understanding that I didn't uh, want to tell the full details and he just said I didn't have to. Um, and were you able to get on a different ship? Uh, yes, yes, I swapped with um, somebody else. And had you heard anything about that ship that you were about to uh, go on deployment with? Uh, no, nothing really, um, but I did hear that the person apparently hurt themselves to get off the ship, so I guess I was taking their spot because they hurt themselves. And so then you were deployed to another ship and is it the case that during this deployment, the chain of command for your department was an all-male all chain of command, is that correct? Yes. And how were you as a woman treated on this ship? On this ship? Um, I guess disgusting. Um, there was a lot of inappropriate comments made. Um, it was if we did uh, report the comments or ask for help about the behaviour that was done um, by the males in our chain of command, uh, we were just told that nobody's going to care and we're easily replaced if we're going to cause a scene. And can you recall any of the, what you describe, disgusting behaviour or comments that were made to you? Uh, well, I can remember one that was made um, to what was in front of me and uh, like a fellow shipmate, she was female as well, um, that she'd put makeup on that day, this particular day. Um, and the PO had said that he didn't know why we bothered putting makeup on because our face is only going to be rammed into a pillow. And can you recall your reaction to that? Um, I just asked for those comments not to be made because they were quite disgusting um, and made us feel uncomfortable. And when you said that, what reply or response, if any, did you get? Um, nothing really. He just laughed and then walked away. Um, and then, like I said before, we tried to report the comments and we were pretty much just 
yelled at and told that no one would believe us. And whilst you were on that deployment, was there any demarcation in terms of how the work was distributed, distributed between the men on the ship or the women on the ship? Um, well, um, us able seamen, um, or us um, below the leading seamen, um, we had to um, do a lot more duties than they did. Um, and me and the um, fellow female shipmate, um, we did most of the duties. Um, we didn't get much time off. Um, and when we did get time off, we actually weren't able to leave the ship. Um, so it just made us feel pretty crappy. And how long was this deployment for? Uh, eight months. And how would you describe it? Hell. And can you tell the Commission why you would describe it as hell? Um, it was long hours, really hot conditions, which I guess is to be expected given the, the job. Um, but with no one to talk to and no one to help us or to stop what was being said to us um, just made it really bad. And when you say help stop the things that we said to you. Are you, are you referring to the disgusting things that were said to you? Yes. And how was your physical health at this point? Um, well, I got to the point where um, I was working such long hours that um, my feet and in the conditions, they were like always wet, so they didn't get a chance to dry out properly. Um, so they started cracking and bleeding and that. Um, and when I went to get help for that, um, I was told that I created an issue. So it just made you feel like if you got sick, like, you know, you're in trouble. So is it the case that you weren't allowed to get sick? Yeah, it felt like that. And... Did you become sick during this employment, D during this deployment? Apologies. Yes. yes, yes. And did you have to seek medical care? Yes. And where did you do that? Um, I was taken off the ship and I was taken to a hospital. And what was that experience like? Um, not very good either. Were you able to get some treatment? Um, yeah, I guess enough to get me back um, to the ship because that's where I wanted to be because where I was wasn't any better than the ship, so I just wanted to go back there. And when you returned from the ship, having sought medical assistance from the hospital, did anything happen? Did anyone say or do anything? Um, yeah, I was given extra work because I had time off and I obviously wasn't that sick, so I got more work. And when you returned home, were you sleeping and or eating okay? No, I would... Um, I, I guess I was sleeping, um, but I wasn't really doing anything else. So I'd just sort of go into, I guess, what some would call like a hibernation state. I wouldn't socialise with people. I wouldn't do anything. I was just, I guess, having catching up on sleep but not really sleeping that well either. So is it the case that you withdrew? Yeah, from everybody. And... In terms of your mental health, how would you describe your mental health at this stage? Um, pretty poor, pretty horrible. 
And were you seeing a psychologist at this time? No, I went to the doctor and asked if I could go see a psychologist because I felt like I needed help. And what happened after that? Uh, when I saw the psychologist and the psychologist was concerned for me um, and wrote up, I don't know, like a letter to say that I needed some time off. And did you approach the chief petty officer at the time about getting some leave? Yeah, I provided him with this letter um, and he just told everybody that I was getting extra time off and asked me why I'm so special. And when you, when you say he told everybody, he said that in front of you, did he? Yeah, when I was standing there. And in front of other people in the Navy? Yes, yeah. I'm going to ask you some questions about the last few years of your active service. Can you describe for the Commission, please, what those last few years of active service were like for you? Um, um, I don't know, not very nice and at some points a bit scary. And. Were you on base at this point or were you in another deployment? Um, no, I got off um, that ship and I was on a base now. And what were you doing while you were on the base? Um, I was just working um, part-time for defence. And did anything else happen while you were on the base at that time? Um, during this time, um, the, I had an ex-partner um, or a partner and then it ended badly, so it became my ex-partner. Um, and he would follow me and he would get others to follow me and ask people to watch me and try and get information about me. When you say others, do you mean other people in the Navy? Yes. And did you tell anybody in the Navy about this? Yes. Um, I went to the military police um, after I sought um, an AVO, like an apprehended domestic violence order, um, about what was going on. Um, and saying that he breached the AVO and they didn't do anything further than say they were going to talk to him. And was, was that the military police that you went to speak to about the breach of the order? Yes, yeah. And did, did they do anything when you told them that the order had been breached? No, they just said that they were going to talk to him. But I never heard anything else other than, besides that. And was it at this point that you decided to leave the Navy? Yeah, well, I decided to take some uh, leave without pay because I was just fearing for my life. Um, I just felt scared and unsafe. And so then did you put in an application for leave? Yes, I put an application in to take leave without pay. And... When you made that application, what was the process involved in having to get leave? Um, I had to fill out some forms and I had to provide a reason or add a statement onto it as to why I was leaving. And what did you put on that statement? Um, I had written on there that I felt unsafe and that I was scared. And when you provided that statement to the relevant person, did they say anything to you about what you had put on the statement? Yeah, they told me that I had created a headache for them because um, I have to do lots of paperwork now or because I didn't feel safe. 
And did they say or do anything else? No, I just had responded when that was said to me that maybe if people got some help when they were asked for it, they wouldn't have to write it in the statement. And after you were told that it created a headache for them and about the paperwork, did you leave the part about feeling unsafe in the statement? Um, at that time I did, um, but when I tried to leave defence altogether, I put the same thing in there for my reasoning as to why I wanted to leave um, and I was told that I had to take it out, otherwise it was going to take years to get out. And did you take it out? I took it out because I didn't want to be in there anymore and I didn't want anything holding up the process of getting out. Would you have preferred to leave that statement in, that, that comment of yours in the statement that you felt unsafe? Well, yeah, because was, that's the only reason why I was leaving was because I wasn't getting help and I felt unsafe. And were you seeing a psychologist at this time? Yes, um, I saw a psychologist um, outside of defence that I found my self. And who was funding that psychology? I was. Well, my family would help if I couldn't afford it. And was there a reason why you went outside of the de defence to seek that help? Yeah, because it just felt like every time I asked for help, everybody else found out why I was asking for help. And my private information was shared with everybody when like, it shouldn't have been. So I just didn't feel like I was going to get any help, so I went elsewhere. And did you do that research yourself? Did you find someone on, you know, on your own? Yes. And was there, apart from this statement that you said you needed to fill in as part of the forms, was there anything else that you needed to do to be able to leave the Navy? Um, apparently I was meant to book a transition appointment, um, but I wasn't told this when I put everything in. They, they gave me a date of when I had to come back. Um, and I went in for that date and time um, and I was told that I should have booked my appointment myself um, even though they told me that everything was organised and I just needed to come in that day for what I don't know. They just told me I needed to come back on that day. So I came back um, and it made me feel really frustrated and quite upset that um, I'd taken time away from like my family and my son um, to go in there for the day and for no reason. And were you required to find a job before you could leave the Navy? Yes. In order to leave, I had to provide evidence that I had a job that I was going to. And did you manage to find a job? Yes, I found a job doing something I didn't really want to do, but it got me out of, it would help me get out of defence, so I just stuck with that job. And is it correct that you are currently in the Australian Reserves? Yes. Do you want to be in the Reserves? No. When I filled out the paperwork, um, I didn't tick the box to be put in Reserves because I didn't think that having that, still attached to me would make me feel any better. And do you know why you can't leave the reserves? No. I've sent emails, I've made phone calls and there's just no response. I've tried Googling how to get out and nothing comes up, so I've got, I don't know how I get out. And does being in the reserves impact on you in any way? with respect to your personal life or with respect to any entitlements that you can receive? Yeah, so I've been told that um, 
certain aspects of like rehab or assistance that I can get from DBA is affected because I'm technically still a serving member in the in the reserves. But it's the case that you don't want to be in the reserves, is that right? Yeah. And since leaving the Navy, not the reserves, but the Navy, have you been diagnosed with any mental health conditions? Uh, yes, I was diagnosed with PTSD and anxiety. And were these mental health conditions recognised when you were in the Navy? No. And before being diagnosed with PTSD and anxiety, who paid for your psychology sessions? I paid for them myself. And did you have contact with the Department of Veteran Affairs? Um, I did, um, like a year or a bit longer after I left. Um, I made contact um, and I eventually found the paperwork that would get um, some help. They would pay for my appointments. And do you know how long that took? Well, it's only, I guess, been more recent, so it's nearly 18 months after leaving Defence. So for the 18 months up to then, you have been paying for your own psychology sessions? Yes, and if I couldn't afford them, my family would help me. In your opinion, Witness, how does the Defence view and deal with mental health? Um, they sweep it under the rug, like with any issue doesn't necessarily just have to be mental health even if you like I said before if you hurt yourself it's like you've created an issue and you, you can't get sick so mental health is definitely no different. And how important were your family in helping you get through some of those really difficult times? Um, very important because if I didn't have my family I probably wouldn't be here. And how do you feel about having joined the Navy now? Um, I honestly regret it. It is, given that I joined at such a young age, it's, it impacts my life now and I'm sure it's going to continue to impact my life forever. Witness, I have one further question. Do you have a message to other women who are current or former serving members of the defence who have been sexually assaulted during their service, do you have a message for them? Yeah, I would say that it's not their fault and don't let anyone make you think that it's your fault because it's not right and I think that they should speak up much like I'm trying to, I guess, do now. Um, and... I don't know. I think they just need to find somebody or reach out to family. If you can't speak to someone in defence, speak to family and, I guess, try and get some help because it's definitely not their fault. Witness, can I thank you for your courage and your bravery in speaking today and giving evidence to the Commission. Commissioners, I have no further questions. Thank you, Ms Bridges. Commissioner Brown? No. Commissioner Douglas? No. We don't have any further questions, but I'll just echo uh, the comments of Council Assisting. Thank you for your evidence and thank you for coming forward. Thank you. Is the witness to be excused from the attendance notice to attend? Yes, please, Commissioner. Okay, so we'll note that. If there's no other uh, issues, we'll adjourn for five minutes just between witnesses. Okay, All you. rise. The Royal Commission will now adjourn.
All rise. The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Uh, Mr Singleton. The next witness is Jasmine Carmel, the mother of Jared Brown. I would ask the Associate to administer the oath of affirmation. Thank you. Ms Carmel, do you solemnly declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Are you right, Doc? You're right, Doc. Pray that for me. Commissioners, could I just announce our appearance, please, for the witness, Ms Carmel? I appear again with uh, my junior, Ms Marsh. Thank you, Ms McMillan. Ms Carmel, could you tell the commissioners your full name? Jasmine Carmel. And have you made a statement of evidence to the Commission? I have. Um, commissioners, the statement has the code number JCA quadruple zero, triple zero one, triple zero eight. I tender it as a confidential statement. Thank you. It will be accepted and allocated uh, as the next exhibit number. Commissioners, I can indicate I've been alerted to some very minor corrections which I'll attend to in the sequence of the examination, if that's not too Thank you, Mr Singleton. Ms Carmel, uh, you're the mother of Jared Brown? Yes, who was proud older. mother of Jared Brown, sorry. Could you just tell the commissioners a little bit, little bit about Jared as a son, as a boy and as a man? Absolutely amazing. He's my eldest son, my firstborn. Oh, I love that photo. Um, he taught me unconditional love. He taught me how to be a mother. Just, where do I start? Um, a bundle of joy, um, a handful, very intelligent from a little age on, um, would challenge you as a person and a mother. Um, at school, he was known as the sponge always wanting information, um, would brag if he got in trouble because they would punish him by sitting him down to read books. <laughs> hey, Mum, I got in trouble today. I got to read books, you know. So he was a bit of a bookworm. Um, from young on, he loved aeroplanes and anything aviation. His room was full of aeroplane memorabilia, as in a quilt and pillows, and wanted to be a pilot. <laughs> from a young age. At school, he was very academic, um, very high achiever, very sporty, gave everything a go, you name it. Um, from primary to high school, it was t-ball, football, soccer, cricket, um, even cheerleading, but that was to try and get to the girls, sorry. But <laughs> he was charming. He was very much a person who how do I explain it? Had an eye for the underdog. If somebody was being left out or in trouble, he would stand up for them. He would go to that corner and defend them and be there for them. He didn't tolerate bullying. Um, even when his younger brothers went to school, he always had their back, especially in high school. Um, Oh, there's so much I could tell you about him, but not enough time. He was good looking, charming, loved his mum, great big brother, could you excellent tell us, mate. <laughs> could you tell us a little bit about the expression, love you more? Love you more, okay. It started when he was young and you would put them to school, to bed and you'd kiss them goodnight. And if anyone can imagine what having three boys putting them to bed at night was a bit of a handful. And as I'm walking out, he'd say, love you more and I'm like hang on no way I love you more and he would say back no I love you more mum and this carried on to my other sons so you know you'd be in the lounge room like I'll oh, just go to sleep and be love you more and this continued on throughout our lives with cards and um, the day he enlisted I gave him cufflinks and 
a tie pin and it had Love You More on it, um, the last person to get off the phone would always be the last person to try and say Love You More. And that still continues now um, in our family where the grandsons say, love you more, grandma, and you know, love you more than more is what I try and say to them. But it's just, it's our words. It's also on his resting place. There's, They're me, also his last words to me. Let me ask you some date questions. When was he born? 3rd of January, 1988. I'm doing this in chronological order. The next date is 9-11-2001. What significance did that have? Okay. I remember having a friend call me and tell me what was happening, turn the TV on, and he was there. And I, th I can't remember how old he was, 10, 11, 12. Um, I'd have to do the sums. I'm sorry. I'm not thinking the best right now. But And I tried to explain to him what, what the possibility of this meant. And he's like, no, Mum, this will blow over, all the rest of it. And he watched it intently. He had an interest in, in politics from a young age and war, the history of war. Um, my parents were German, so they would talk to him about it. So I'm first generation Australian. And so it was always a topic in our home. To be honest, I didn't think he would be the one to join the army at first, but he always wanted to be a pilot. Um, and it's my second son who actually is now a a current reservist. This just continued and, yeah. <laughs> the third date question is, um, did he enlist in the army on the 24th of July, 2006? He did. He got out of school and straight there. They wanted him to get a little bit of life experience first, which he did. He did a bit of, a bit of labouring, a bit of retail work. Um, sorry, um, and then he went back and originally he applied for the RAF, so, but he didn't meet that criteria there for some reason. I, I don't recall or have memory of the reasons why. What did he think of the army in the first couple of years? Oh, so he was chuffed. He was chuffed. Like, that picture you saw before is his proudest moment when I can remember not earlier speaking with Brend Dr. Brendan, Brendan Nelson, sorry, and we were sitting down at the table, and this is after the March Out Parade, and he went, Mum, and he pointed, and I took a photo, and I have never seen my son so proud. Um, when he enlisted in the army, he didn't... He nominated his father as the next of kin. There's a reason for that, I believe. That Can was, you tell us yes. about that? Um, he explained to me, Mum, if something happens, because he knew he was going to be deployed eventually, and he didn't want me to have that possible knock on the door or me to worry about anything. For example, when he came back from Iraq, he would look at what I'd been looking at to try and keep up an eye on things. He'd say, don't look at that, don't look at that, don't worry about me, Mum, I'm right, I'm good. Um, he had two deployments. You mentioned Iraq and the other one was Afghanistan. Yes. Um, so far as you could tell from talking to him and your other observations, were they similar in nature for him and his experience or Absolutely quite different? Absolutely not. And I'm gauging that by when he came back the first time and when he came back the second time. My last words for him every time he went, both times, were, you do what you've got to do to get back here safe. He needed to know that he had my support. Heck, if your mother doesn't support you, <laughs> you know. What was your impression of his experience in Iraq, which was the first of the two deployments? Um, it was my understanding that he was just in the green zone and there was a lot of training that happened before he went. Um, and I don't have a lot of information. It was what I... I know that the deployment went longer than actually expected and the date was put back a bit, but that's what happens. But, yeah, totally different from when he came from Afghanistan. What's your understanding of his experience in Afghanistan? Where do I start? Um, now, I can't recall if it was Iraq or Afghanistan, but I remember him calling me once when he could. He hadn't been there long, 
and I could hear background noise of gunshots or artillery or something. And he said, hey, Mum, we've got to go. Just want to let you know that I'm OK, that I'm here. And yeah. So the experience in Afghanistan, um, I, I got social media so that I could just know he was okay because we don't have any information. Um, and I would wait up late at night waiting for that little green light to come on because obviously internet connection and time is not a luxury over there. And I would just go, oh, good. Or you'd get a phone call and it'd be like, hey, mum, I can't talk, but I just want to let you know I'm okay. Other times you might get a phone call. Remember, you're, you're sharing his time with other family members and loved ones. It was just great to hear their voice. I do recall him one time telling me, um, and I'm trying to get the wording right, so the wording might not be exact, about when they were under fire and something about support not being there. And he wasn't keen to go out the next day. Um, during his deployments, he lo we won't use any names today, yep. but he lost one of his comrades. He did, he lost his best mate. Um, after that, uh, was he given an option to come home? He at was, some point? he and was. What, what decision did he make? I know one of the other mates came home he spoke with me and he was what I would describe as shaky, distressed, in grief, um, really upset that he couldn't have been there for his mate. He said, I could come home, Mum, but I don't want to. I want to finish the job. I want to be there for my other mates. I'm going to do it for him. Did he have home visits during his deployments? Uh, or just at the I end? can't recall just... Iraq. Um, he did have two weeks leave when he was in Afghanistan. And we talked about that beforehand. And I said, look, if you come home, I said, we still have to be at work. There's no one basically here for you. So I don't know, you might want to bleep this bit out. His current girlfriend at the time was also a serving member. And so they had organised to meet in Greece. Um, and that's where he was when there was quite a few lost. And he shortened his leave and went back straight away. He was just devastated. Is there anything else you'd like to tell the commissioners about your insights into his deployment before we move to his transition? I know that, well, actually, before I say that bit, on his way home, Thank you. Thank okay, you. thank you. All rise. Jared, the fourth one. The Royal Commission will now adjourn.
The Royal Commission into Defence of Veterans Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Uh, commissioners, thank you for the short adjournment. There's no application that anybody wants to make, but I have used the opportunity and had the benefit of a discussion with Council for the Commonwealth, and that will inform my next move. Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> There's no, not at all. There's nothing, nothing to worry about, Miss uh, Carmel. The, can I just take you now to how you found Jared after he came home? Okay, I, I remember them, the date being put back each time. I remember him saying he couldn't wait to be home. <laughs> That's challenge accepted, that photo. So, <laughs> um, just one moment, sorry. You give them the biggest hug and you wait for them to come through the door. And while you're doing that, you're with the other families and you know that there's some parents who don't have the opportunity you have, that their boys and girls did not come home. So you have a, this bit of survivor guilt, I guess, yourself. And we talked to my amongst ourselves while we're waiting. And then they come through the door and you just run and you hold them. And I said the same thing as I did when he came home from Iraq. Sweetheart, you're grounded. <laughs> and he'd say, yes, mum, as he held me tight. Um, then he went away with his mates and girlfriend and did what they had to do. And then in due course, he came home and it's just, I'm trying to describe the look on his face. As a mother, I could see uh, his eyes, his pain, um, totally changed, just the look of his eyes. And he'd be looking around the room and he'd been there many times and was struggling to make conversation of all things because you can't say, hey, how are you doing? What have you been up to? Um, not the normal stuff. Um, you just tell them that you love them and that you're so glad they're safe and home. Um, he remained in the army after he came home for about another 18 months and yes. was then discharged, is that right? He did. And around that time, did he tell you or say something about a psychological report? Yeah, this was um, a bit of concern for me because... I was already, uh, from a distance, seeing that he was not the same person. I could see that he was having trouble having ordinary conversations, having to change his language, um, you know, and apologising, and trying to understand their language because they speak in another language from my perspective. What's a CEO? What's this? What's that? You know? But he mentioned when he wanted to get out that they were encouraging him to stay, but he'd, he'd literally had enough. And he mentioned um, about a, a psych report and that he had got possibly a mate or somebody similar to sign it off for him. I had immediate concern and I, I went to say something and I started to, but the demeanor at the time was like, hey, what can I do? Um, you're a grown man. I don't understand the process. Is this legal or not? Um, that's been on my mind for, for quite a while. I feel that that's possibly would be good to be looked into because if there is a crack in the system there, it needs to be fixed. Um, he, he had developed a number of skills in the yep. army, some qualifications. How did they serve him when he went back into civilian life? He, he did tell me that he had to redo, redo a few of them um, in respective 
I can't remember exactly which ones, but he did tell me that they're valid. He said, I can, I can drive this over there, I can drive that, but I've got to go and get my other license here and I've got to redo my first aid, I can do this and that. So there were other, I can't remember, there were quite a few things he had to get ready before he could start going into work. So was it your understanding that some of the qualifications that he had weren't recognised as valid back here in Australia? Most definitely. In civilian life, that yes, is. Yes, I knew what you meant. Um, he went on to do some fly-in and fly-out work in Western Australia. Yes. And then had enough of that and moved to Perth, is that right? Uh, he was, well, it was Western Australia. Um, a mate of his had put him onto a job. They like the army guys, you know, they're disciplined, they're used to being away from home. They don't take bleep this crap. They they have got good work ethics. Um, so he was doing fly in and fly out, which I think, don't quote me, was two weeks on, two weeks off. Um, and then eventually things got a bit tough with our one week on and one week off, which was just too much. And also in that time, there was relationship problems. Um, so we, we talked about it and I, so we put his stuff in storage because um, he wanted to keep it with me but I had no room. And I said, we'll organise to have that taken to you when you're settled. And I think that's one of the problems when they become isolated, um, away from family. And while he was away, I noticed that getting contact with him was getting further and further away. But I'd also noticed this a little bit earlier, um, that tending to pull away a little bit from family. Not that, you know, as any opportunity he had, he would come and see us, of course. Um, but it was different. In March 2015, approximately, as best you can recall, yep. uh, did you meet someone from the army? And there was a bit of a coincidence. Yeah, it might have been a little bit earlier than that. I can't recall the exact date. Um, but where I worked in hospitality tourism, it's there's a um, a reservist depot not that far away. So we would op often see a few people in their camis around. And this particular day, <laughs> I, I did that. Oh, my son was in the army, you know. Um, do you know him? No, I didn't actually say that. but. And the chances are that they did know him was true. And so he was a previous, can I say the rank? Yes. Sergeant of Jared. And he was with another younger gentleman. And when we talked, the other gentleman said that Jared was his Lance Corporal when he was in Afghanistan. And they asked me how Jared was going. And I expressed my concerns a little bit, gambling, drinking, pulling away from family a little bit. Now, this is a mother's perspective, so, you know, we worry about every naughty thing that our boys and girls do. Um, and the younger gentleman said, oh, you know, I'll, I'll make contact with him. And then I would see them every now and then, and every time Sergeant would always say, hey, how's Jared? He, you know, he was a, appeared a very caring man. Um, and then, if I can go to Mother's Day 2015. Yes, so perhaps I can note that this is a point where you want to actually correct your statement uh, to yeah. say that you met the sergeant again actually on Mother's Day, is that right? I did, I did. He was in civilian gear, but because I knew who he was, and just prior to that, about a week or so prior to that, I'd had a phone call with Jared where he had told me it's the downest he's ever been. And I had talked to him about trying to encourage him to see a psychologist and find someone over there. And I'd started sending him um, an app for PTSD because I, I was genuinely concerned. <laughs> Sorry, I just can't smile, but when I see a beautiful photo of him. Um, and I ex approached the sergeant, even though I knew he was with his family, I apologised and I said, look, I'm really worried about Jared. And I told him what Jared had said. And um, he said, I'm, I'll make a call. I think you may have used 
a phrase like an app? Did you, uh, you, said, you, sent a, did you say you've sent an app for, psych, uh, for, for PTSD? For PTSD, yeah. I didn't know. Jared was in WA um, working on the um, what he was doing over there and I didn't know how to help him. I didn't... I wanted him to acknowledge that he needed help. I wanted him to, to seek help. Um, so I had no idea what to do. But you, sent, you said you sent him an app. Is yeah, there was an app um, which a friend had um, told me about for PTSD and, and some things to um, help you. That's up for a smartphone. Uh, I don't know. I'm not really technical. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. So how did you send the, send this, whatever it was? Uh, from oh. a mobile to his mobile. Right. Yeah. Um, now, in this period, can I just ask this question? Uh, did you have any contact with the Australian Defence Force? I've never had any contact with the Australian Defence Force. Do you know if Jared heard from them to get or received any support from them in this period? Not that I'm aware of. Um, turning to the second correction in your statement, which is at 46, uh, you said if within a few weeks of meeting the sergeant the second time, uh, I think you now say that you're not sure of how long it was, but did you meet, uh, after that second meeting, um, did you receive a call from Jared about going to South America? Yes, I did. It was not long after it. Um, he knew never to let me find out anything on social media. So he rang me at the airport and said, hey, mum, I'm with the boys. I'm going to South America. We're going to do some traveling. I naturally presumed at that time, oh, silly me, that somehow someone had contacted their mates and they had taken him under their wing. And the places he said he was going to with Peru and that, I thought, oh, good. My thoughts were he's going to do some healing. They're going to be with his mates. And I thought that this was um, a good thing. And so far as you are aware, did he make the trip to South America? Then? He did. Um, not long after he left, unfortunately, my mother passed away and he couldn't come back. Um, and then I think they went to New York shortly. And I encouraged him to stay um, because I really, I was on the, the, under, the understanding or the belief that possibly he was getting, you know, some sort of support and connection again, which is what he might need, which is what I thought he needed. After his trip, did he at one point make a phone call in which he said everything was skewered? Or yes. skewed, I should say. Yes, it was after he had returned. Um, so I think we're talking about August, September. And he, that's a correction you want to make to paragraph 47 of your statement. Uh, it yeah, a, a it's just the, the timing. You... I just couldn't recall everything, and, yes. and I'm not 100% sure, but I know it was after that and before he came home, so in that interim period. Um, I didn't... When you say came home, do you mean coming back Come... to Australia from America or back from... America, from... Right. yes. So he called yep. you from somewhere in the Americas. No, no, he called me from WA. Right, so, so he'd, he'd gone back he to work. Before he came home to Queensland. No, yes, yes, I'm so sorry. That's all right. Yeah. That's all right. So um, there were times where he wouldn't respond to my calls, um, but I also knew that with his hours that he couldn't always, and when I start to worry, I would say, hey, young man, give your mother a call, elusive son, you know, we're worried about you. Eventually he would surface and say, hey, sorry, Mum, work's been busy, life's been busy. Um, and there was this one particular call when I spoke to him. He said, I'm so sorry, Mum, he said, but life is skewed, everything's going wrong, I've lost my job, I lashed out at somebody, um, he was out of work, and there was other things going on, I think, that I was unaware of at the time and still unaware of. I think it was just an accumulation of lots of things. Some, at some point, a little after that, he returned to live with, or returned to Queensland? Yes, I encouraged him to come home. I, um, I paid for flights for him, and he basically came home within the week. I helped him pay bills. 
Um, he missed his grandfather's birthday celebration. Yeah, so him. he'd come home mid-October, roughly around the 16th, and um, so he'd go away every now and then to catch up with mates and come home. Um, and my dad's birthday was the 31st and we were expecting him to be there because um, I was trying to get him to reconnect with the family. And um, he didn't turn up. Um, and I thought, wow, what's, what's going on? So sending message, hey, sweetheart, where are you? Are you OK? And, you and then the next contact I had with him was on the Melbourne Cup day 2015, where I received a text message about 3.34 in the morning. And it said, I'm so sorry, Mum. I'm really sorry. I love you more. And I, um, I presumed it was because I had sent him messages to find out where he was. I know he had gone to Brisbane, but I had expected him back. Now, somewhat later in the morning, you received a call from an unknown number. Number, yes. I received a call from an unknown number because I kept on phoning him, sending him messages, trying to, to work out what's going on. It was about 7.30 in the morning, if my recollection's correct, and it's an unknown number, and it was Jared, and I, I was grateful to hear his voice. And bear with me, sorry. Um, you take your time, and if you want to break, you let us know. I'm OK, I just need a minute, a minute a second, sorry. He said, Mum, I'd made a silly decision. I've made the silliest, I'd made the silliest decision of my life. And I said, what, sweetheart, what, what's going on? And he wouldn't tell me. And I was trying to find out where he was, but he was in obvious distress. Um, and it wasn't like my son to speak like this with me. It was not a normal um, tone in his voice. I wanted to know where he was and he wouldn't tell me. Um, he was embarrassed and I threatened to contact his mates and find him. And that's where he said, hang on, Mum, I'll find out. And he said he was at Royal Brisbane Emergency Psychiatric. Did you go and visit him there? I did. He did not tell me why. I just um, contacted work, said I'm not coming in, family emergency, and I went straight there. One of the, you saw him there? Yes, so I got the direction of, of where to go. And um, so there's an office here and then there was a door. And Jared saw me and came out and gave me a hug and said, I'm so sorry, Mum. Um, I didn't know who to call, but I knew I could call you. He didn't tell me what had happened at that stage. He made light of the fact that they had taken his phone off him, um, he'd been drinking, and they'd, they'd taken his belt from him. I don't know if you need to bleep that out. Um, and then a nurse or attendant came and took me into the office, and he told me what had, that Jared had been... I can't, don't know how to explain this without... Well, you, you got some details yep. of what why he had ended up at the hospital yes. and they're in your statement. Is that right? Yes. Thank but you. Sorry. Can I sorry. just ask you about yep. this? You had a discussion with the nurse and you told the nurse that he uh, was depressed and you thought maybe he had post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. Um, and you mentioned that that may have come from his time serving yes. in the army. Did the uh, this nurse or the medical person in attendance make a suggestion to you? Yes, um, that, that? that we call the ADF barracks at Anogra, which is where he used to serve from. Did you make such a call? Yes, he did. So he, did he, he, made, the he made the call for me. Um, he asked if I wanted to. I said, oh, Sorry, can you Who call? made the call? Uh, the, the attendant. Right. Yes. And what was the result of that call? What information or feedback did you get? He's not in anymore. So who's not in what? Jared was yeah. not a serving, current serving member. And, and what did that mean for the support the ADF would give? 
nothing, absolutely nothing, zilch. I had no idea what to do next, absolutely nothing. In fact, you took Jared home? I did. I feel like I've let him down, and I know that's not rational thinking. But we, we, um, I didn't know where to turn. Might I interrupt? I think my client might need a short break, if that's in Would order. Would you like a break? Yep, yes. Thank you. Ms. Thank you. We'll just have a five-minute break. Please All take right. your time. Sorry. Tissue. The Royal Commission will now adjourn.
The Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide is now in session. Please be seated. Commissioners, thank you very much for that short adjournment. My client's indicated she does want to continue with her evidence. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms McMillan. And Ms Carmen, if I apologise, we should have realised that you needed a bit of a break. Please do not feel you need to rush with your answers. If there's at any time you just want a break for five minutes, just say, I'd like a break. There's no rush. Ms. Campbell, is there anything you'd like to tell the commissioners about how Jared was in the period after you brought him home from hospital? Um, I'd like to explain a little bit more about the environment he was in yeah, before, at the hospital. I, before yes. I took him home. Yes, if that's all right. Um, I feel that there was just this big concrete room with some bars in the corner, which you could see out of. Um, there were other people there who he was worried about. There was one young lady always still worried about how somebody else was, was doing. And there was someone opposite him who was a previous um, higher rank at the army who was there for a partner. Um, and he was, he, he was like head down, hey mum, let's not talk too loud. I'm a bit embarrassed. He didn't want the other person to recognise him, which he didn't from what I could see. We talked about um, following up on some psychiatric help, psych psychiatry help, sorry. Um, they checked his blood alcohol and um, they said he was fine to come home with me, but I also explained that he wasn't driving, I was. So when we got home, we had a bit of lunch um, and I let him sleep. Unfortunately, I didn't have a room for him. Um, he was sleeping on an air mattress in the lounge room. I did have to go to work the next day. And when I come home, I said, have you rang somebody yet? And he said, yes, I have rang someone, but they haven't called back yet. So we had to leave a message. And um, later on in that time, I can't recall, it was the same day or the next day, prompted again. He said, no, they haven't called back. He said, I'm going to have to call somebody else. I believe that to have been um, VBCS at the time. Now, I was on the un understanding that VBCS was just for veteran support. Uh, I didn't know that at the time, that it was for everybody. It's all in hindsight. Um, so we had an appointment but he had to wait a couple of weeks before he could see them. Now, the other thing I'd like to say is when we left um, Royal Brisbane, we were given a handwritten note with Nambour General's acute care number, which I, of course, had given to Jared. So I forgot to mention that earlier. And was that the only documentation of assistance that was given to you at the hospital to take home? Yes. And uh, there's a new name for the organisation, VVSC. Yes, What's I believe that? it's called Open Arms now. Right. Did, did Jared also um, go to the DVA, the Department of Veterans Affairs? Uh, as, as he's home, I think we had another four weeks. Yes. He had that appointment. Um, he talked about the counsellor saying he might need some medication. Um, he didn't have a doctor up here, so I went to my GP and I explained that he'd had appointments with the VVCS counsellor and this is something I feel needs to be addressed also with local GPs. He didn't know what VVCS was and that's nothing wrong with that, but I think that needs to improve that they need to have access to somewhere they can send us also. That's gone, bear with me. He gave me a phone number for a doctor he recommended, which was about 25 minutes away towards Golden Beach, uh, Caloundra, um, which I'd given to Jared. I don't know whether Jared followed through on those appointments or not. So when Jared was home, I was trying to reconnect him, take him to appointments, take him 
to the bus, to the trains, and also still work. And at that stage, I still had my dad in a nursing home who I was trying to look after and get guardianship of. It was a lot. Um, and have I gone off track? No, 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 no we want yep. to get your experience, but um, you have spoken in writing of Jared coming back from the Department of Veterans Affairs oh. and describing a process or he had heard about a process. Can yes. you tell us about so, what he told you and what happened? I was trying to problem solve and he had no money, so I was still paying bills as much as I could, but he had no work also. So I encouraged him to go to Centrelink. So he did. He went to Centrelink, who sent him to the DBA. And it's my understanding that he went to the local DBA office. You take your time. And if you want another break, you just tell us. No, I'm fine. He came home. I was already home. And he told me that he'd been to the Centrelink. They'd sent him to DBA. He had rattled off the processes of everything he had to do. And it was just this whole long list. And I'm like, I had no idea where to start with any of this. I have never seen my son so hopeless, so devastated and broken. The exact opposite to this photo that we see here. And I held him in my arms and he was sobbing and I had no idea what to do. And I said, how about we ring the sergeant? You trust him? He said, mum, I can't, it's my pride. Uh, the next day was, um, he appeared a bit different. He was like hot and cold. And prior to all of this, he was, uh, there was times where he was just jumping into conversation about Afghanistan. And I won't say what he would say. And then he'd look at me and stop. It's like he, he wasn't there with me or he just realised, hang on, you're my mum or something. He, the, the ticking on the, of the clock would annoy him. He wasn't sleeping. But the next day, there was a sense of um, him feeling un, unsure. But then there was also a sense of, I'm OK. And he had said, can you look after my jacket and medals for me, mum? And I had um, put them aside, said, yes, I'll, I'll look after them for you. Then in the afternoon, he said, come, Mum. He, he, that's right, he told me he didn't want to go to a party tonight, but then he did want to go to Brisbane. And that his mate, I can't mention the name, was going to pick him up. There was a little bit of confusion because he kept changing the time of when I was to drop him off at a particular suburb. We went and saw he wanted to go and, and connect with the brother who wasn't living at home anymore. And we saw him, but his nephew was asleep. We didn't stay long. Mum, we'll do anything you want tonight. <laughs> anything you want. And that was Jared speaking to you? Yes. And we did a little bit of Christmas shopping and we talked about what we're going to do for Christmas for his grandfather and, and the family, how we'd get together. And he talked about New Year, how he was going to take me to the fireworks. So I took him to this suburb and on the way, there was a, an RBT on both sides of the road. It's a busy section. And um, he, 
appeared really uneasy and nervous. Um, and I said, it's okay, I said, it's okay, sweetheart. I said, I'm driving. You're not, we have both haven't been drinking, you know, nothing to worry about. And then eventually I went <laughs> down to where he wanted me to drop him off. And for some reason, I didn't want to stop the car. I didn't want to stop the car. I don't know what was going on. And um, he said, oh, just here, just here. And I said, no, 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 where does he live? He'll meet me here. We might have a drink before we go to Brisbane. So I did. I pulled over and he reached over and he kissed my forehead and he said, love you more, Mum. And that was the last I saw him. Later on, the police brought, contacted you. Yeah, so the next morning I woke up... Uh, I don't know, with a, a sense of foreboding. And when my youngest son, Jace, came out of his room, I said, look, I don't know what's going on, but when Jared, when we pick Jared up tonight, because you're supposed to come home, and that's what I was on the understanding, what Jared had told me, I was to pick him up. Um, and I had given him my last $50 and my credit card, and because he told me he needed some medication I said, you get whatever you need, sweetheart. And I said to Jace, I said, something's not right. When Jared comes home tonight, we're going to sit him down and we're going to work out what's going on. And I remember the concerned look on my son's face. Um, so I proceeded to, to go to a Christmas outing at a park but I had this uneasy feeling and I kept ringing him. I don't know why I just did and there was no answer. And I left the party early and I checked my phone and there was a message from the police in that suburb, could I please call them? Um, for some reason I couldn't um, find that phone number and I rang my son Kieran and I told him what was going on. I said, have you heard from your brother? And he said, no. Um, I said, I need this phone number. Can you look it up for me? He said, yes, I'll ring you back. In the meantime, I had found that phone number and I rang them and they asked me if I had anyone with me and I said, no. And I told them where I was at the time. And they said, can you get anyone to take you home? The police have already been there, but nobody was home. This is about 11 o'clock, 11.15 in the morning. And um, I started to drive to meet them at my place. And Kieran called me and asked me where I was and I told him, and he was basically begging me to pull over, and I wouldn't. Um, uh, my, my instincts were, oh, my God, you know, they've gotten into a fight or, you know, something, the two boys together, you know, drinking too much. That's what I was thinking. And Kieran had told me that he'd seen on social media that there was a possible suicide at this suburb which I believe was later taken down. Um, but Kieran was not aware of what we were going through, with, what I was going through with Jared. And I just started screaming, no, no, no. And I remember pulling out into the traffic. And when I got there, the police were already there at your home? Yes, outside. And um, they told me what had happened. And I basically begged them to tell me, it's a mistake. It's a mistake. Um, they took me inside and got me off the street. <laughs> um, by that time, Karen was not long behind. 
and um, a lot of it's a bit of a blur at this point. I know that they asked me if anybody, if he was with anyone else, and I explained that he was supposed to be um, picked up, and I obviously I, I expect that they looked into that, and obviously the mate didn't know, had nothing to do with it. Um, they also asked, because I explained that he was ex-serving, so they asked for his um, identification, and Kieran went where I had put his dog tags and gave them to me and I gave those numbers or they took those numbers. <laughs> Sorry, I've just, I had those dog tags in my hand for 10 whole days. <sighs> Would you like to tell the commissioners the date? 5th of December, 2015. You mentioned that at an early stage that you didn't realise that open arms could provide counselling to non-veterans. Um, did you yourself approach them in that respect? I, um, I had no idea who I could call. I'd had zilch experience with mental health, zilch knowledge. I had... Um, been Googling stuff when Jared had come home. After Jared was buried, um, I felt like I was going to break. Oh, and I remember Jace coming home and saying, are you OK, Mum? I had tried to ring a service called Suicide Callback. And I'd been on the phone, no, that's right. First of all, the recording was, if you have this phone, push that number. If you have this phone, push that number. And I hung up, because I didn't know what sort of a phone I had. I wasn't thinking straight. Um, and I tried that again, and it was the same, because I thought I'd rang the wrong number. And um, Jace had come home, and he contacted VBCS, who said, bring your mum in this afternoon or the next morning. Did you have some dealings with them? I, he was, it was an ex-serving gentleman who said, look, I go on leave tomorrow, but if I can't find, he talked with me, if I can't find somebody, I will come off leave and talk with you myself. And he did find somebody, which was at least half an hour away. Because at Christmas time everything closes down, um, and I did see her a few times, and the availability and the distance uh, was not—I'm um, trying to think of the word—cohesive with with life and trying to get back to work, etc. I then um, accessed somebody through my em employee assistance program. And I asked for somebody who was specialised with suicide and I was lucky enough to get... And I think she's amazing. She's helped me so much. She was also a reservist. So she at least understood the lingo and what I was talking about and I didn't have to explain it to her. Um, so I was using that up for as much as I could. Um, my work were kind enough to extend more than six appointments for me. During that interim, I also did ask for some help with VVCS because I had to fill in a form and I remember a form coming in the mail that I had to fill out. And I had to tick the word other because I wasn't a mate. I wasn't a, a child. Other? <laughs> I hope that's changed. Um, one moment, please. So I know that the services were available to me and there was one time when I was uh, running out of my work ones because um, in this period I had, within a two-year period, I'd lost 
my mum, my dad, my son, and unfortunately a grandbaby. So um, it wasn't like I'd just run over a cat, you know, it was just, it was very complex. And the trauma, I was really struggling with that. I needed some help with anxiety and stress. And I had seen online um, an advertisement by BBCS for a stress and anxiety course. And I rang up, I said, can I put my name down? And they said, yes, of course you can. It got cancelled because there weren't enough participants. And I had to wait again and it came up again. And I remember trying to contact people and get them to make the numbers so I could do it. It got cancelled. And I understand that, but... So they put me onto another counsellor, um, which was about half hour's drive away. Or she would meet at a closer suburb at the time. But one of the rooms, it, it just... They were hired rooms. They weren't very private. They were smelly, <laughs> one of them. And then the other one at the other one, in a different suburb where I would go to her, where she lived, she had another hired room and again wasn't very private. You know, you could hear people laughing outside in, in you know, the hallway and things like that. Um, she was really struggling to work with everything I was going through. But VVCS had suggested an app about stress and anxiety and they said, take this app to her and she can help you work through it. But when I got there, she had no idea about apps whatsoever. So it's like I had to go over old ground again. And I kept on telling her that I think I'm going to break. I think I'm going to break. But she was trying to, I feel that she was trying to problem solve because there was so much going on. Because when your whole family's broken and after a funeral and everything is just too much and you've got no support and you're all broken and you can't help each other. One of the particular concerns you've raised is access to information. Um, let me go through three aspects of that. Firstly, um, have you received any information about Jared and his service um, from the ADF? No. Have you had any contact or support from the ADF? No. Um, did you seek information from the DVA? I did. I wanted to get his files because I wanted some information. I wanted to help me understand what was going on. I needed to understand PTSD. I needed to understand if there, anything had gone wrong anywhere. But in particular, in the back of my mind was what I had mentioned previously about the statement I had said to Jared. I can't recall at what stage. But I rang them up and there was no empathy. It's like, you're not going to get compensation. And I'm like, that's not what I'm ringing. I gave up. I, I knew I could go through freedom of information and forms, but I didn't have the strength. The third place you sought information was from the coroner. Um, can you tell us when you first sought information, when you finally got some, and how you got the information? I don't think I, I sought any information. There was a time where I received a letter um, just as I was going to work and I opened it and it was from the coroner. It was about April. I started to read it and um, I, I couldn't deal with it. I drove to work but I could not remember driving to work at all. Um, one of my colleagues found me in the car park and she went and got my employer who took me to her place. Um, I couldn't talk. I, hey, I couldn't read it. I couldn't continue to read it. Um, at a date not so long, I had, because um, I had contact with the people from Diggers Rest, I rang up and I said, can I come up and talk with you? Um, I am so indebted to that, I don't know if you call them ESA or establishment or the hosts. They have been so supportive in so many different ways. 
Nick, um, can I mention his name? You can. Yeah. He's now a good friend, him and Karen. Uh, he, he read the, the coroner's report and I saw him raise his eyebrows a few times and he told me that I don't have to read it, um, but I do need to keep it, which I did. And I didn't read it again until um, I wanted to produce this document. And um, yeah. In your statement, you've made a number of suggestions for improvements and issues that need to be addressed. I won't go through all of them, but can you tell the commissioners what you think are perhaps the ones that stand out for you or you think are the most important, say the first one or two most important ones? Most important one, a single point of contact that is well publicised for absolutely everybody to have contact with so that we can access timely support. I believe, I believe that Jared's death was preventable had we had the support. I believe that when we left Royal Brisbane, that perhaps there could have been a small team that had come to my house, someone to help me, someone to work out what Jared needed. Um, but it has to be well publicised and it has to be available for absolutely everybody. Um, not just serving members, but family and friends and mates, anything to do with the military family. Do you have any final words or conclusions that you wish to offer the commissioners today? I do. I have written a closing statement. If you would. Thank you. <coughs> We've got this baby boy. In a quote attributed to Mahatma Gandhi, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. I demand that we collectively, as part of the society that calls on our young men and women to serve, that we stand tall and be counted as those who recognise those of our military family who are vulnerable, hurting and suffering as a result of the actions successive governments have demanded on them. I demand that we take extraordinary actions to support, care and nurture all of those who reach out for help, all those who reach out, whether they be the member their family or friends need to be heard, responded to, and extra sorry, and ensure extraordinary efforts are undertaken to not allow even a single person in our military family to feel like they had no other option than to end their lives. I am angry. I'm angry that successive Australian governments have shied away from their collective responsibility to our ADF personnel, serving members or veterans in meeting their side of the contract, implicit in a person's oath of service to their country. That agreement is surely not intended to be one-sided. Surely the expectation that members will be cared for is implied. I'm angry because the governments of Australia have previously been educated in the sad stories about World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam. I'm angry that they have refused to learn the lessons of the past for what is seemingly a matter of dollars. I'm angry that I have to be here to tell my story to tell my beautiful son's story and to make, try and make sense of how he fell through the cracks. I am angry that support from Veterans Affairs often boils down to a battle with Comcare, which is effectively an insurance agency. The solution is not a simple one. I am angry that appropriate funding and support of the agencies who have stepped up and provided their best efforts to fill the void in support for our military families is not evident. This needs to be improved so they are not begging for funds. 
It is because they have to beg for funds indicates the lack of understanding or commitment that government has regarding our vulnerable people. At the very least, we who support those vulnerable people in our homes and with our families and community need a well-publicised single point of contact to seek assistance. Sorry. This single point of contact must be able to ensure appropriate referral services to ensure that the request for assistance is taken and action to take an action taken to provide timely and appropriate care and support. There must be an appropriate oversight body, such as an independent inspector general to monitor the process and report widely. Why is it that funding is an issue? As a nation, we see fit to invest $44.6 million in defence in the last financial year. Surely it's an appropriate, surely it is appropriate that a fixed percentage of the defence budget be applied to veteran and member support. Even if a quarter of 1% of this budget was allocated to member and veteran support fixed each and every year, it would be a start. We still have not really quantified the extent of the issue. We still see trust issues between the members and veterans and those who should be supporting them. My view is pretty simplistic. Government, step up, stand tall, honour your side of the contract in the oath of service to each and every servant that each and every service person utters. Be remembered as the government that finally created an ongoing, effective support for our most vulnerable. It's a difficult fight, but it's fixable and a lasting legacy for our most vulnerable. Do this in honour of those we have lost. Do this so another mother does not have to walk the path that I have had to and many others will have to in the face of inaction. Commissioners, you must prosecute our messages in a manner that takes no quarter in this battle for the lives of our military family. We will remember them. This is for you, sweetheart. Love you more. Ms Campbell, we want to thank you for sharing your, so your story and your son with us and for Sorry, the effort. I got a bit passionate. <laughs> a little, uh, for, sharing, uh, for putting your effort into your statement and for coming here today. Commissioners, I would yield to Ms McMillan. Ms McMillan? Yes, thank you. I have no questions for my client. Might she be excused from her son? Well, we please? just may have a couple of I'm, things to discuss I'm sorry, with her first. I... Yeah. No, that's okay. Yeah. Um, and if there are any issues <laughs> arising out of what we may say, um, we can come back to yes, you. Thank you. I can't see them. I was going to suggest you have a drink of water, Miss Carmel. <laughs> Please take your time. We might just discuss a couple of things quickly with you. We won't prolong it. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. Okay. Commissioner Douglas. Okay. Um, I just want to clarify one issue, two quick issues, if I may. Um, did, what communication did you have with the coroner's court? Did, were you interviewed at some point, or did they come and speak to you? No. They didn't get a statement from you? No. Just that letter. Okay. Was there any, at any time, an offer of grief counselling by the coroner's court? 
No, no, no contact whatsoever that I can okay. recall at all. Okay, and the Inspector General of the Australian Defence Force, the IGADF, did you have any contact with them at all? No. Okay. Are you aware of them? No. You... Okay. That's all from me. Uh, Mr Singleton, any matters arising? No. Um, subject to okay. Mr McMillan. Mr McMillan. Speaks, uh, no, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms Carmel, I'll just, again, as Mr Singleton said, I just want to thank you for your courage. Thank you. Um, if there's no other matters arising, um, we'll just excuse you from your summon for your notice to appear. So you're, you're free to go, obviously. And again, all we can do is thank you for being here today and for sharing your story with us. Thank you for what you're doing. Okay, um, we're not going to have a five minute break. I'm, I'm aware of the time, so we might just plow on if that's okay. Thank you again, Ms. Ms. Carmel. Uh, Mr Gray um, will uh, have some closing arguments together with uh, Mr Connor uh, and then we will finish for the day. Thank you, Mr Gray. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioners. During the opening address, we said there would be a focus on lived experience and we were determined that this inquiry would be heavily informed by it. But I don't think I truly appreciated the power of the lived experience evidence we were going to hear. This hearing has made that power clear. In this hearing, we have been privileged to hear accounts from close family who have lost loved ones to suicide, defence members and veterans who have experienced suicidality and veterans who, while living with and surviving their own trauma, or moral injury have helped others at earlier stages of their own journeys. This crucial evidence has been courageously and thoughtfully given. We are grateful beyond words to the people who've shared their experiences and perspectives publicly during the hearing. We are also very grateful for those who are coming forward and speaking to us behind the scenes. To recap only briefly, without being able to do the accounts heard publicly this fortnight full justice, we want to say something acknowledging these people and their accounts now. Ms Nicola Jamison, now Dr Jamison, told the Commission about her son, Private Daniel Garforth. Private Garforth, took his life in 2014 after disclosing to his family that he had been bullied and belittled by his chain of command over a long period and subjected to disciplinary processes after his performance declined along with his mental health, leaving him feeling profoundly devalued. Since her son's death by suicide, Dr Jamison has devoted her professional life to suicide prevention and has acquired great learning, in particular, on moral injury, which is the subject of a doctoral dissertation and which can arise from a range of factors, including feelings of betrayal. Dr Jamison is focused on highlighting the many gaps, problems and challenges with the ADF on suicide risks and on working towards resolution and positive change within the ADF. 
Miss Alexandra Bailey gave immensely moving evidence about her sister, Terry Bailey, and told us that Terry's dream of serving in the Navy went terribly wrong after a knee injury led to a spiral of events, leaving her isolated, bullied and abused, sexually assaulted and suicidal. Ms Bailey's family feel that they do not know the true extent of what happened to Terry in the Navy. Ms Bailey spoke about the effects on the family of the ADF's actions after Terry became absent without leave trying to escape from the Navy. Ms Bailey also spoke about how after some years, during which it appeared that Terry had recovered, in a relatively short period immediately before Terry took her life in late 2020, it appears that the things Terry had experienced in the Navy were causing her distress she found unbearable. Mr Peter Jenkins gave evidence about his son, Private Sean Jenkins. He told the Commission about his son's deployment to Afghanistan in early 2014 and the traumatic events he encountered whilst deployed. Mr Jenkins observed a significant change in his son upon his return to Australia. Private Jenkins endured poor sleep and, when, and was uncharacteristically withdrawn and experienced some bursts of anger. Shortly after being diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, Private Jenkins took his life on 31st January 2016, less than two years after his return from Afghanistan. Mr Jenkins' lived experience highlighted the critical importance of deployment care and providing ongoing mental health support before, during and after deployments. As Mr Jenkins said, we need to become the best in the world at supporting our ADF members. Mr Isaac Adams, a veteran, told the Commission about finding his own path to recovery from trauma and suicidality outside of the system of supports provided by the government through horsemanship, training and caring for horses, and generally being with horses and teaching others about them. This is an inspiring story and contains much wisdom and insight on the topics raised by this Royal Commission. As Mr Adams put it when asked what should be done for defence members leaving the ADF, and I quote, I believe that they need to be treated individually. I feel that we need to give these guys the tools and start to give them the abilities to make their own decisions and support them in what they want to do after they discharge. Mr Phil and Ms Lauren Goodwin, father and sister of Private Ryan Goodwin, told the Commission that Private Goodwin was deployed overseas and had disturbing experiences. He was discharged from the Army soon afterwards and then suffered a steady decline in wellbeing for approximately seven years, suffering PTSD symptoms and eventually engaging in substance abuse. His family told us they struggled as best they could but received no support from the ADF and had significant difficulty in dealing with the DVA. In 2018, Ryan Goodwin lodged a claim with the DVA and it was ultimately accepted, but three years later, 18 months after he passed away. Mr Simon Marshall gave detailed evidence of his experiences over his 37 years of service in the Army. Mr Marshall gave us great insights into the way the chain of command operates in practice and how aspects of army culture and organisation can lead to the persistence of abusive conduct 
and stigmatisation of help seeking for mental health issues. He described significant problems with the processes of discharge and transition, including timing and lack of support in that process. And he made several recommendations for improvements. Witness BR2, a current serving member of the Navy, commenced his testimony by relating his harrowing experiences almost 10 years ago now on his first operational deployment, one that went for many months and involved many traumatic experiences. A key problem he highlighted was the absence of any effective post-operation screening, debriefing or support. Not only that, but he related that the so-called post-operation psychological screening process or POPs had a lasting harmful impact on him, discouraging him from opening up about his traumatic experiences and laying the foundation for development of deeper, persistent mental health problems in the future and alcohol abuse to suppress his emotions. Together with risky and harmful elements of defence culture, such as the stigmatising of mental health issues, discouragement of health, help seeking, and a culture of substance abuse to suppress emotions, this was a dangerous mix. Witness BR2 drew links between these factors and his own PTSD and suicidality. He spoke of nearly losing his life and of the support of mates and professionals that have brought him back. He also made suggestions about improvements to the provision of mental health supports, culture and transitional arrangements for people leaving the ADF, particularly where there are medical reasons for a person leaving the ADF. Mr Lee Bailey gave evidence about the unexpected struggles he faced in civilian life after a long and successful career in the army and about the critical role of mentoring from older peers who have walked that journey and survived it. One important piece of wisdom he related to us was, the army makes a soldier of you, it doesn't make a man of you, you have to do that on your own. He spoke very movingly of the prevalence of suicidality and trauma amongst the veteran community and about the transformative positive experiences he's had with Trojan's Trek. Mr Michael and Mrs Patricia Fernandez de Viana gave evidence today and spoke movingly about their son, Flying Officer James Fernandez. He graduated with first class honours in electrical engineering from Curtin University in Western Australia. He dreamed of becoming a pilot in the Royal Australian Air Force. However, after failing basic flying training school, his mental health significantly deteriorated. Flying Officer Fernandez never recovered, ultimately taking his own life on 25th July 2019. His experience reinforces the importance of continued support in the Australian Defence Force and particularly ongoing career support and independent ongoing mental health supports. Mr and Mrs Fernandez de Viana also told us of their experience of inadequate support and engagement by the ADF after their son's death. Their experience raises critical issues about the treatment of families and the harm that can be done without timely grief counselling and other supports that must be respectful of both deceased defence members and of their families, such as immediate practical assistance with transport for funeral arrangements. While the Fernandez de Vianas eventually made contact with Open Arms and are appreciative of the way that organisation responded, the family's experience of the services to which they were referred was very mixed. Their experience also raises questions about the processes of the Inspector General of the ADF and the processes of coroners and about family access to records. Witness BR1 gave evidence today 
of having been sexually assaulted by a fellow shipmate very early in BR1's career in the Navy, a few days before her first deployment. She was aged 18 at the time. BR1 detailed the effect of the surrounding culture and attitudes in, in deterring her from reporting the sexual assault and getting help. Her experiences of then belatedly trying to get help, the undermining of her reputation and the profound lack of any official support within the Navy. Her evidence gave us glimpses into the harmful impact of the cultures experienced by BR1 as a young woman in the Navy, including her sense of isolation from help, particularly when at sea. This includes most concerningly failures and harmful conduct on the part of her chain of command. She also bravely spoke about how these experiences impacted on her mental health and how through her family, she has managed to survive horrible thoughts of ending her life. And just now, finally, we've heard from Ms Jasmine Carmel, who told us about her son, Corporal Jared Brown. Corporal Brown served in the army for six years, including in Iraq and Afghanistan. After his discharge, he struggled without support from the ADF and found the processes of the DVA too daunting. Ms Carmel spoke of the need for more proactive contact for veterans and that single point of contact and better information for the families trying to support those people. Ms Carmel's evidence of the impact on Corporal Brown shortly before he took his own life of the burden of DB DVA claims requirements was deeply disturbing. Ms Carmel also spoke about the deficiencies in support for grieving family and the barriers on information placed in families' paths, whether intentionally or not. Her evidence made clear real risks for family of secondary trauma caused by unempathetic official interactions, including coronial processes. We confirm, Commissioners, what we said at the ceremonial hearing on 26 November about our intentions in adducing as much, as much lived experience evidence as we safely could at this hearing. And we adhere to that intention for the future of this inquiry. All the lived experience evidence at this hearing was presented as the perspective of the witnesses concerned. All efforts were made to avoid anything that could identify individuals who may have been criticised in that evidence. And we are not inviting you commissioners to make particular findings of fact about the events referred to in these accounts on the basis of the lived experience evidence you've heard in this hearing. In short, the lived experience accounts in this hearing were not led as part of detailed forensic inquiries into objective facts in the nature of so-called case studies. As we said in our opening remarks on 29 November, a limited number of hearings in the nature of so-called case studies will occur next year. And those hearings will involve notice to people who may be the subject of adverse findings about the events to be scrutinised in them. But that is not what we set out to do over the last fortnight. Although we're not seeking specific findings on specific events referred to in the lived experience evidence heard in this hearing, that evidence is going to be of great assistance to the Royal Commission's inquiry in a number of ways. To name just two, first, it will be important in helping us to identify issues that are of concern and that need to be addressed. Secondly, these accounts will be an important element in the overall body of material that you commissioners will be able to use to inform yourselves in reaching general conclusions about needed reforms and making your recommendations in due course. Now we've said a great deal about the lived experience witnesses who've given evidence in the hearing. In addition, and without 
being exhaustive about it, we want to acknowledge the witnesses who gave evidence in their capacity as representatives of organisations and of defence and veteran family support programs and who also shared publicly aspects of their own lived experience. We are struck by how many people in such organisations and roles have come to their roles after living through very difficult times themselves and who are making immense contributions to veteran wellbeing and suicide prevention from a position of actual experience and insight. And without being exhaustive, we mentioned, for example, Ms Bronwyn Edwards, Mr Michael Stone, Padre Gary Stone, Major Heston Russell, Major Retired, Associate Professor Ben Wadham, John Williams, Nick Forster-Jones, Renee Wilson, Wesley Woolerman, Luke Adamson, and Dr Phil Parker. And the list could still go on because many of the other witnesses we heard from are working with veterans regularly in support organisations and care roles and are also doing so from a foundation in lived experience of their own. But we won't try now to mention them all by name. This brings me to the various support organisations whose representatives appeared on five panels called during the past fortnight. The focus here was not so much on the large and established organisations that have a seat, say, on the ESO roundtable, the ESORT, that consults with and advises government, but rather on getting a broad range of opinions about conditions at the coalface in supporting defence members, veterans and their families. We have obtained useful perspectives from these panels about the issues of key concern to them and when weighed in light of the lived experience evidence we're receiving, we think we'll have a very solid foundation for identifying lines of inquiry to lines of inquiry, commissioners, to follow up during the next stages of your work. The work done during recent reviews by the Productivity Commission and the Interim National Commissioner for Defence and Veteran Suicide Prevention will also be very helpful in this endeavour and that work gives you a significant head start. Likewise, work done a little earlier by the Australian Human Rights Commission on the treatment of women in the ADF provides important context for the cultural change strategies defence has in place. We were fortunate to hear from the authors of all these reviews during the hearing. Commissioners, over the course of the hearing, you were introduced to a range of doctors and specialists also with expertise in physical and mental health matters particularly relevant to military service. Commissioners, because we're not inviting you to make any specific findings at this time, we are not asking you to make directions for parties who were granted leave to appear or anyone else to make submissions on the evidence you heard over this hearing. All the evidence heard at this hearing was presented to you to assist in the identification of issues and generally to inform your approach to future lines of inquiry. Those lines of inquiry will now be pursued in various ways after the hearing, including by the issuing of notices. In due course, evidence that was heard at this hearing may, along with other evidence obtained during the Royal Commission's work, be referred to in submissions to you, Commissioners, and perhaps in the conclusions that you may reach. However, it would be premature to invite submissions on that evidence now or for you to set a deadline for such submissions. That said, any person, including any party that was granted leave to appear, may, if they wish, make submissions to the Royal Commission until the date for closure of public submissions, which is mid-October 2022. And no one is prevented from making a submission referring to any aspect of the evidence in this hearing block, if they wish. Now, without attempting to be exhaustive, can I say that we see various themes emerging from the material you've heard over this hearing block and various potential lines of further inquiry, including some which I'll now mention, cultures within the ADF. There's reason to think that some effects of tribalism within the ADF can result in harm and a sense of betrayal for some defence members. It's not surprising, perhaps, that ADF cultures might emphasise hyper-masculine values and intense unit loyalties that are regarded as useful for combat. But these cultural traits can have serious consequences for the individuals caught up in them, both in the immediate present and over time, including potentially moral injury or trauma. 
In particular, women appear more frequently to be adversely affected by behaviours that are linked to cultures in the ADF. This can include sexual abuse. As we know, the age-adjusted suicide rate amongst women who have left the ADF compared with women in the general community, as reported by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, shows that service with the ADF elevates the risk of suicide threefold amongst females under 30 years old. We can hypothesise that there is a connection with ADF cultures and with unacceptable and unlawful behaviours against women. It must be possible for a professional soldier, sailor or aviator to be highly effective in combat in defence of our country at the same time as being respectful and caring for all their mates, including those who admit vulnerability or who are different. In fact, isn't this the only true path? Isn't this the only way of holding true to the tenet that the ADF leaves no one behind? Other aspects of these ADF cultures may be increasing suicide risks, including stigmatisation and structural career-related disincentives against seeking help, especially for mental health conditions. Coupled with the risks of trauma faced by servicemen and women in the ordinary course of their duties, these cultural factors are a potentially very dangerous mix. Leadership and accountability. What measurable progress is being made on these matters? What data collection, reporting and responsive action is needed? Are the processes of military justice being used appropriately and effectively? Are the processes of the Inspector General of the ADF working effectively? Leaders in the ADF at all levels play a critical role. They set and continuously influence the standards of their units and good leadership and management skills are essential to healthy cultures within the ADF. How can we ensure accountability about leaders' performance in these areas? And at the highest levels, how effective is the leadership of strategies to address suicidality risks? And what more is needed to ensure public accountability and concrete progress? Families. There are a host of issues relating to the need to inform and engage families of defence members and veterans. Much can be done to ensure families are and remain connected to the defence member during their service. And then when that defence member leaves, families can and should be fully informed partners in the transition to civilian life with all its complexity, including the needs that might have arisen from impacts of service, financial planning, House, housing needs, education opportunities, skills translation, employment and social connection. Families having access to information about their loved one during their service, during their deployments and during any health treatments may and should assist in keeping families connected and supported. And in the event of tragedy, there are concerns that families are not being granted appropriate access to records about their loved ones. And this has important implications for accountability and through accountability in turn for whether there's sufficient impetus for systemic change. And finally, for my part, transition. Again, there are many issues relating to the transition of service members to civilian life. At the policy level, there appears to be recognition of this by government and the establishing of the Joint Transition Authority on the recommendation of the Productivity Commission appears to be a positive sign. But the state of progress in implementation of real change on the ground is unclear. There appears still to be a marked mismatch between the large amount of time and effort dedicated to transform a person into a soldier compared with the limited and somewhat shallow efforts at transitioning someone from a soldier, sailor or aviator to a civilian. 
Commissioners, Mr Connor will now complete our closing remarks and in the course of doing so, he will identify further themes and potential lines of inquiry that emerge from what you've heard in this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Gray. Mr Connor. Commissioners, that point of transition that Mr Gray has just spoken to is, is so, so significant. And it's turning, taking a person who's been... Sorry, I might just get you closer to the microphone. Thank you, Mr Connor. My apologies. Sorry. My apologies. Mr Gray has just spoken about the significance of the point of transition, about the, the, the change in the nature of the person, as it were, when they're converted into a military person. And then the, how, do, how does that person then go into civilian life? That's a really, seems to be a really, really important matter. And what is done in that sphere? How well? Is defence and DVA working in that regard? Is there a problem arising out of the existence of defence on the one hand and the DVA on the other? Who is owning the problem? Who has taken ownership of this? How hard has it been looked at? What is the process for facilitating this? It seems to us to be so significant. I'll only talk to a few high-level items. There's a large problem about information, about people in defence, merging from defence, becoming veterans, and they're dying by suicide. How many? Information is emerging. It's emerging all the time. How well is it being assessed? How well is it being looked at? Who is looking at it? How hard are they looking? That needs to be done very well. We think there may be ways of looking at this better, looking more deeply, thinking harder about it. We saw an example this morning um, on the bottom of um, one of the studies, 3.5% of people dying within 12 months of a call to Triple O in Queensland. What are they dying of? How are they dying? What is happening? There's a as Mr Gray has mentioned, there's a concern about the operation of the military justice system. There's a concern about the depth of inquiry of the coronial system. Is it being properly done? Are issues being explored? We can say at the very least that there needs to be proper engagement between the people, the family, grieving and DVA and defence, that, that needs to improve. But maybe the whole process needs to be improved. How well is it being done? We have to look deeply at that and we will be doing that. Is there too much red tape? Have we got overwhelming bureaucracy have we moved to a ticking box system without the nuance, subtlety, the human connection, authentic human connection? Is DVA so set up now that they've got no time, no, no culture, no connection, no understanding of military service or enough to actually engage in a human way with the person who contacts? I think we nearly heard that in, in, from Ms Carmel in a, in a tremendous way. So we, we will be listening very, very closely. And the significance of lived experience evidence is, it is so, so significant. 
And I know, commissioners, you so much appreciate that. There, there seems to be too much red tape, too much bureaucratic stuff. And that, it, and people have to engage with that. Is there some better way of doing this? Is there a, another way of a, establishing a human connection? Does the department have to be utterly administrative, completely bureaucratic? These people have served Australia. We've heard some from many people who have had have deep experience in this area, in veteran care and support in various ways. We've heard from people who have thought deeply about particular areas. There's, as I've said, the, the, the transition, the change that needs to occur there and how that is best managed. How can it be done? How can it be done so much better than it's currently being done? Pace and tempo. We have elite athletes. They train for a period in, in the year. Then there's rest and recovery. And then they go again. We heard from Dr Phil Parker, who's both military, deep military experience, plus medical experience, and he's also thought about it. And he's watching, looking at people. He's seen them physically injured, mentally troubled. What's going on? It seems to be that there's a flat tempo, flat chat, 100% of the year, 365 days, no rest and recovery periods. Does, does defence need to think about that again? Do it in some other way? Look, take the model of the elite athlete. Give them, train them have them available to be deployed, give them a period to, to rest and recover, to repair. We heard from time to time the notion of vulnerability, being allowed to be vulnerable. How do we deal with that? You know, on the one hand, we've got people who've been trained to, to, to defend us. They can't be vulnerable in that context, but can they also be allowed to be vulnerable personally? Can they say something to the people around them? Are they allowed to do that? Can they do that? It seems to be necessary that they allow, that an element of vulnerability is allowed and a safe space to express the vulnerability, then that vulnerability can be, person can recover, come again, come back and be deployed. We heard a number of witnesses speak to that. The medical employment classification scheme, it seems to have shades of tick boxing tick a box, tick another box, and you've gone out this way. Is it nuanced enough? Does it have some subtlety? Does it respect and value the human? Is it, does it display authentic human connection or has it turned into a form? There are many issues that came up and emerged out of the, the, ev the evidence of people who had, had deep experience in this territory. The, there's a problem, it seems, with polypharmacy. What is happening there? What's causing that? Is a lack of integration of records or how's it coming about? Are these, why are these people on so many medications? What can be done about that? How can that system be improved? Commissioners, 
you'll have the opportunity of looking at that. And we believe it's a matter that should be looked at. We've heard on a number of occasions of the significance of, of not over-medicalising this, not turning them, turning, turning a person into a DSM category 5X. Much, it, it's, and this morning, the psychosocial. People, and you, they don't have Many don't have a psychiatric illness. They've got a troubled existence that's dynamic, that's changing with stresses around the place. It's multifaceted, multi, and everyone is different. The complexity of the, of the, the matters that you commissioners have to address cannot be understated. It is immense, but we well appreciate your, your appreciation of complexity, that this can't turn into a simple little series of little rules. It's way beyond that. There are some treatment models that are emerging. Commissioners, you've heard a few of those. There seems to need to be an integration we, of course, had the various repatriation hospitals around Australia, Green Slopes here and other places. And that had a system. And there was, there was some specialist and cultural experience within those places. That doesn't exist in the same way it does, did. What, but doesn't seem to be working so well at the minute the moment, and may need to be some integrated veteran defence specific kind of system. Because veterans and defence members have a culture that they are, they are trained and changed. And how do we bring the military person back to a, to a civilian existence? And we've heard many um, descriptions of that numbing, disconnected, inability to, to interact and so on. How do we recreate the person and reintroduce them into civilian life? Dr Catherine Turner spoke of restorative just culture as a paradigm shift needing to be undertaken a different way. Not about blame necessarily, but looking forward. And what does the person need? How do we provide that need? How do we fill that? How do we assist? How do we help? How does the system work? May I just speak finally to the significance of language and Im imagery and the kind of words we use, the way we say it. And I, I regard so highly the roses in the ocean work, the work of Ms Bronwyn Edwards and her paper language and imagery guidelines. We need to have a rethink along the lines that Bronwyn Edwards is speaking about, about the language we use, about, and the media should be paying very close attention to Bronwyn Edwards' work, should be looking at it, thinking about it, and trying to change things. Create another, use another language, Get away from commit. What a crazy word to use in this context.
Commissioners, you've heard and you've felt the power of the, the lived experience witness. They are so significant. They know so much. They've felt so much. They've experienced so much. And they have things to say. And when their stories come forward, one starts to get a glimpse, some understanding, a little window on things about the problems. As we said in, in opening, Commissioners, and this is not addressed only to you, Commissioners, this is addressed to the veteran and defence population and their families, their friends and so on. If you're a defence member or a veteran with concerns relevant to the terms of reference, we ask you to come forward to tell your story, your concerns to the Royal Commission. If you've lost someone close to you, come forward. We need to hear your voice. If you've lost someone you've cared for, we ask you to come forward. Your voice needs to be heard. Commissioners, as I said in, in I think at the ceremonial opening, we will give our all, our utmost, to, to trying to bring before the Commission material to change the situation, to improve the situation. Commissioners, the next public hearing of the Royal Commission will commence in Sydney on the 14th, Monday the 14th of February 2022. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Connor, and thank you, Mr. Gray, and thank you to all your councils assisting and solicitors assisting teams, and all the staff who have worked tirelessly in the lead up to and during this hearing block. My fellow Commissioners and I are grateful for all your efforts. Our work has just begun. I shall be brief. We've taken the very first steps in our journey of discovery in this inquiry. I echo the words of our council assisting. We're grateful to all the witnesses who have shared with us their stories, particularly those who have bravely shared their lived experience. This Royal Commission is for you. This Commission has so far received over 900 submissions and 180 requests for private sessions, which we are working our way through. We have to do much and learn much in the coming months. I want to mention one recurring theme that we have seen, and that is that people have seen the many inquiries and reports that preceded us, the many findings and recommendations that were handed down, and they may have been disappointed about the lack of progress or inadequate follow-up to these previous inquiries. Therefore, I want to make it clear that my fellow Commissioners and I are acutely aware of the need for ensuring that a mechanism is found at the conclusion of this inquiry to ensure appropriate, effective follow-up action will occur. I want to assure you that we are committed to finding the right mechanism to do so and see this as a priority. We'll adjourn until the next public hearing of the Royal Commission, which will commence in Sydney on Monday the 14th of February 2022. Thank you. All rise. The Royal Commission is now adjourned.